Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as the National Board of Public Health Examiners presents the first in our series of six webinars geared to explaining the domain areas of public health to help you prepare for the upcoming Certified in Public Health or CPH examination. Each study session will be led by an expert faculty from ASPPH member schools and will focus on one of the five core areas of public health. Each uh, session will be two to two and a half to three hours long with a presentation, lecture, and interactive segments. A break will be offered halfway through um, the presentation, and this presentation will be recorded and archived on the MBPHE website uh, one to two days afterwards. Uh, you may register for the remaining five sessions on the MBPHE website. And today's session um, feature is Social and Behavioral Sciences. Please feel free to key in your answers into the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, and we will answer your questions at the beginning of the break and at the end of the session. We are pleased to have Sarah Mona Prisbilla, Clinical Assistant Professor from the University of Buffalo, here to present on the topic of social and behavioral sciences. Mona, you can begin. Hello, and uh, good, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, uh, Happy New Year to all of you. I'm really looking forward to uh, the next few hours that we have together to help prepare you for the social and behavioral sciences component of your CPH exam. Um, as Kate had mentioned, I'm certainly happy to answer questions as we go through, um, or you can post them um, directly here, and I'll be able to answer them both at the break time and at the end. But you're certainly welcome to email me uh, later this evening or uh, as you prepare for your exam. Uh, my email address is just mona, M-O-N-A, at buffalo.edu. So if there's something that you want clarification on or ways that I can kind of help in your preparation, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm more than happy to assist if I can. Um, so the way that I want you to really think about how we're going to approach today's presentation is, um, oops, I'm having trouble advancing, uh, is to really think, there we go, um, think about social and behavioral sciences and public health as bringing together multiple disciplines to work collaboratively for both health prevention, promotion but also for disease prevention. And so what I think is really unique about this particular webinar that you're hearing about and this particular area within public health is that it's certainly um, thinking about a multidisciplinary approach and using strategies that draw upon strengths from different areas. So when we think about the social and behavioral sciences within our discipline, we primarily use three major strategies. So you'll see those listed here on the slide. The first is we're really thinking about how we can en enhance our understanding not only of those behavioral factors that determine one's health and well-being, but also those social factors, those social determinants of health that play a part. So what's really important to note here is that this tends to be a quite a comprehensive approach. So we're not thinking about things just at the individual level or at the patient level. Uh, we're also thinking about factors that happen interpersonally between people, things that are operation, operationalizing either at the organizational level, at a policy level, at a community level. And it's not just about risk behavior. So this first bullet is really thinking about things from certainly risk factors uh, that can have a behavioral foundation. but also think about things from a protective uh, approach. So there are protective factors that we can think about in our in the way that we approach behavior, but also how we think about those social determinants. The second strategy that's important to think about in terms of the social and behavioral sciences is that we don't just come up with prevention strategies that we think sound good or that sound like, oh, this is a neat idea. We are using things that are theoretically driven that have a solid evidence base. And so we're developing intervention strategies from these theories of change that have that secure, solid uh, rationale and evidence uh, in the literature. That evidence base comes from research that has been systematically tested and has demonstrated that, in fact, an intervention works above and beyond what the usual and customary practice would be. So again, it's just not taking something that sounds good or sounds attractive as a way to develop an intervention. Rather, we're using some clear theoretical rationale and demonstrating some, uh, some evidence in the literature that suggests a particular intervention is appropriate given the uh, behavior change that we want to make. The third strategy I want to briefly mention to you is we uh, also do things 
uh, from very systematically in terms of using particular models for not only program planning, but also evaluation programs. And so really, I want you to think about the social behavioral sciences from going uh, from a perspective of understanding to action, using theory and using that as a way to uh, apply it in terms of practice. And this is really some of the key features of the social and behavioral sciences in the practice of public health. So I've prepped the, uh, our time today in a presentation that covers eight different areas for competency for the social and behavioral sciences in public health. And you see those eight competencies listed here on the slide. So I've divided my presentation today into two parts, parts one and two. And what we'll do is we'll have a 10-minute break between the two. So in part one, uh, for the first half today, we'll cover first the patterns of both infectious and chronic disease. Second, we'll talk pretty extensively about the social ecological model as a theoretical framework that we use uh, when we're approaching public health problems and figuring out how to address them appropriately. Third, I'm going to walk you through various health behavior change theories and give you some clear uh, examples of them that I think will be helpful to you as you prepare for your exam. And then the final component of part one this afternoon will be on basic principles within health promotion and disease prevention. After we take our 10-minute break, we'll then cover part two. We'll pick back up reviewing some key ethical principles in how we think about program planning and evaluation. Next, I'll walk you through some basic uh, planning models that we use in public health. Uh, after that, we'll talk about evaluation methods. We'll talk about process, impact, and outcome evaluation, even uh, efficiency evaluation. And then we'll close today's presentation with a review of sustainability and also how we go about scaling up programs. So let's jump right in with part one in that first section, which is all about patterns of disease. And so the slide that you see up on the screen presents a changing pattern of, the disease, of diseases in the United States between 1900 and 2010. And so what I want you to do is kind of focus your attention at the leading causes of death over the, uh, this 110-year period. Basically, what we see is a pretty striking change in the diseases that are leading to mortality that really present to us as public health professionals. So if you focus your eyes to the top half of the screen, what you see here is the top leading causes of death in 1900. And so you see, for example, that the top three uh, in 1900 included pneumonia, tuberculosis, and gastrointestinal infections. And so clearly you can see that those primary, um, the primary causes of mortality in the United States back in 1900 were certainly infectious diseases. If you now focus your attention to the bottom half of the slide, what you see now are mortality uh, rates in 2010. And certainly we've seen a, a pretty dramatic shift here. So you'll see that heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, stroke, now the leading causes of death in this country have really shifted away from infectious disease to chronic diseases, so uh, non-communicable diseases. And really this calls on different public health strategies and different public health responses because of the nature of these diseases that are confronting us in society. And so this is kind of a, a really kind of a, a, a sentinel, um, very important message that you want to get across is that we're experiencing this shift in how uh, diseases and mortality exist in this country. So that said, while, the, while you know, certainly looking at a domestic perspective is important, I think it's also important to look at this globally. And if I talk to maybe friends or, or uh, family members, uh, they, I think there's generally a common misperception out there that the mortality pattern that we see in the developed world is strikingly different from the developing world. But certainly, that's actually not the case. So what you see here in this slide are different causes of death shown by different colors. And so the bottom blue bar represents communicable diseases, maternal, perinatal, nutritious conditions. Um, the red bars that you see here are the premature deaths from non-communicable diseases for people under the age of 60. Three, the third piece in green are deaths from non-communicable diseases age 60 and above. And then the purple bar way up at the top is injuries. And so the message here that I really want you to think about is if we add together those green and red, 
those non-communicable diseases across the two different age groups, we see that that accounts for nearly 60% of worldwide mortality. So 35 million out of the 59 or so million deaths worldwide that occur every year are in fact a result of chronic diseases. And so the, really the important take home message that I want you to have here is that chronic diseases are not just a problem of the developed world. They are not a pattern that we only see in the United States, in North America, and in Europe. Certainly the global mortality pattern has changed and chronic diseases really account for a, a significant lion's share really of, of mortality worldwide. Okay, so come on, advance please. Ah. So I'm just pausing for this next slide to open here. There it goes. Okay, so my apologies for the delay. So the next slide, again, to just to drive home this message is this is a comparison between 2000 and 2012. So instead of looking at a 110-year period, we're now just looking at a 12-year period, looking at global causes of death. And even in that just decade or so period, we're seeing a decrease in deaths that are uh, associated with infectious diseases and a rise in diseases that are associated that are more chronically um, associated. So even from the first couple of bars that you see, heart disease, stroke, COPD, we're actually seeing increased number of deaths uh, globally from these three kind of classic chronic diseases. And then for things like tuberculosis, way on the bottom of the screen, you're actually seeing a decrease between 2000 and 2012. So again, recognizing that the uh, mortality patterns that we see in this country and in this our planet are certainly evolving. The next slide that you see depicts the age standardized mortality rates based on cause. And so across the bottom of the screen, you see there are different regions of the world based on income category. So the far right end of the slide are high income countries, including the United States, and then the, all the other categories include low, middle, and middle income countries based on uh, geography. And so these are uh, World Health Organization uh, designated regions and World Bank income categories. And so again, we see that the leading cause of mortality in the United States are not all that different from the global patterns uh, that we see. The key exception here is Africa. So if you look at that first set of, of uh, bars on the far left-hand side, Africa certainly has a big chunk of communicable diseases. Um, certainly part of that is tuberculosis as well as HIV, for example. But again, the important take-home message is that the approaches we use in the United States are critical because they have global health relevance. Our planet is dealing with chronic diseases, and many countries that historically were plagued by infectious diseases a few decades ago or even a few generations ago, they're now finding themselves in quite a different situation, and they're having to deal with chronic non-communicable diseases as they have successfully tackled many of the infectious diseases that were plaguing their societies. Um, yet they often don't have the infrastructure in place on how to appropriately handle chronic diseases. So again, the United States is not unique, and if anything, our experience with chronic diseases has meaningful relevance from a worldwide perspective. Again, I want you to really be thinking about this from an income standpoint as well. So um, recall that the impact of chronic disease is not just an issue in high income countries such as the United States or Canada or parts of Western Europe. Again, I think there's a common misperception that cardiovascular disease and cancer, these are really diseases of, of wealth and affluence and a certain type of you know, poor dietary choices. But if we actually look at the country categories on this slide defined by the World Bank income income groups, even within low and middle income countries, you see that the majority of worldwide chronic diseases are in fact occurring in low and lower middle income countries. And this reality really guides us when we're thinking about public health action. We really need to think about things from a global perspective when we're considering and developing public health strategies related to chronic disease. So why does this have to? Why, do, why does she go into all this detail? Why this, is this important to have this backdrop as a framework for understanding social behavioral foundations? Well, 
I think it's important, and I'm going to shift gears a bit, but I think you'll see how we need to think about the distribution of diseases and mortality patterns, and that leads us away to think about how we consider tackling those leading causes of death as we are experiencing this shift from infectious to chronic disease. And so really the first thing we need to do when we think about prevention and early intervention with chronic disease is that we really need to understand and acknowledge what are those key factors driving chronic diseases. So we need to understand the behavioral risk factors of preventable death. So the data on the slide that you see here is from the United States, and we're looking at risk factors and the number of deaths per year attributable to those risk factors. So what you can see from this slide is that the leading indicators of the actual causes of death include tobacco, diet and physical inactivity, and alcohol consumption. And those three primary categories account for the lion's share, almost 75% of the actual causes of death. And so again, these behavioral risk factors are some of the major determinants of early preventable uh, death in this country. So it's not just about what is the disease that is, uh, that is leading to the mortality, but it's about the behaviors that people are engaging in that lead to the development of these chronic diseases that then ultimately lead to mortality. I also think it's critical to mention that in addition to understanding the behavioral factors that are associated with the leading causes of mortality, we also need to consider those social influences that are at play when we think about health promotion and disease prevention. So I want to quickly just spend some time talking about health disparities and health inequity and how these are related to causes of death in the United States. So this, this uh, webinar certainly is not just about behavioral foundations, but those social foundations that play a part in public health. First, let's define health disparity. People generally in the public health world defined health disparity as uh, a higher burden of illness, injury, disability or mortality that's experienced by one group of people or one population relative to another group or another population. And so these poor health outcomes that our groups experience could be a consequence of discrimination or exclusion based on uh, some type of socio-demographic characteristics. So some of those are listed on the left-hand side of the slide here. So gender, race, ethnicity, geographic location, sexual orientation, age, et cetera. The slide that you see then, now the information here on the right hand, shows a health disparities when it comes to cervical cancer. So what you see here on the bottom of the slide is time. You've got a year of death from cervical cancer between 1999 through 2013. And then the different colors represent different groups of women based on race and ethnicity. The rate of women dying from cervical cancer has certainly varied depending on their race and ethnicity. And so you see that in 2013, all the way on the far right-hand side of the slide, black women were more likely to die of cervical cancer than any other group. And that's followed by Hispanic women, then white, then Asian Pacific Islander, and then finally American Indian. So the striking pattern here is really where you see mortality rates being higher among African American women relative to other women from other uh, races or ethnicities. And so again, when we see poor health outcomes consistently for certain socio-demographic groups, whether it's race or age or gender, this pattern indicates that certain groups may be experiencing discrimination or exclusion from public health approaches. Now that could be in the form of assessment, or screening, or prevention, or even treatment approaches. But this is a, certainly an example of a striking health disparity based on race ethnicity with this cervical cancer example. So again, let's kind of walk through a little bit more about health disparities and some of these contextual issues. And I'll uh, use that as a way for, to help you think about uh, not just the disparities, but also inequities. So most dictionaries would probably define disparity as difference. That's usually the term that we uh, use as a synonym for disparity. Disparity is a difference. Um, that difference can be in age, in rank, or it can be in condition. And disparities uh, are, again, kind of synonymous with differences. Inequality tends to be defined as the lack of equality either in opportunity or in treatment or status. And equity, though, is something that's a bit different. So when we talk about inequity, that signifies an ethical judgment, an instance of either unfairness or unjustness. 
Another level is added if you include a judgment of what is considered either unnecessary or something that's avoidable. So there are certainly disagreements regarding the definition and the use of the terms disparity, inequality, and inequity. And usually these disagreements center on which term to use, whether a judgment of whether something is in fact avoidable or whether in fact something is considered unfair, and then how those judgments are made. And really these conflicting views that we have in public health have implications for how we allocate resources, and they certainly can reflect different political ideologies. So decisions regarding what is avoidable or unjust are not simple. They are complex. Um, but they're usually based upon what we currently know, uh, and they're oftentimes based on political decisions that have to do with resources and ideology. So who is actually deciding what's avoidable? Who is deciding what's unjust? And then how do they come to an ultimate decision? For example, if you start with the premise that health is solely an individual's responsibility, not a uh, societal responsibility, so if you think health is responsible uh, at the individual level, then you won't consider other factors that are amenable to intervention. So in the context of public health and social science, disparity has really begun to take on the implications of injustice, but still may be distinguished from the, that general term of inequality. So really, conceptually speaking, a health disparity could be viewed as a chain of events signified, again, by a difference in either health status, a particular health outcome that deserves scrutiny. It could be a difference in access to, utilization of, or the quality of care that you received, or in your social and your physical environment. Such a difference should be evaluated in terms of both inequality and inequity, since what is unequal is not necessarily unequitable. Um, so I know that's a lot of information, but I think it's really helpful to think of a health disparity as really an evidence of a difference in a health outcome between two or more groups. So that previous slide that showed you the differences in cervical cancer mortality across uh, race groups for women, um, you see the evidence of that disparity. Health inequity is something quite different. Health inequities are avoidable inequalities in health between groups of people, whether it's within countries or between countries. And those inequities arrive because of systematic inequalities within and between societies. So a health inequity is when we say that the health disparity is due to some form of systematic injustice. It's not just a pattern based on socio-demographic characteristics, but there's some social driver, there's some social force at play in the pattern that we see, and that is reflective of a systematic injustice. To close this section, I thought it'd be helpful to provide you with a resource from the World Health Organization. If that slide will pull up here for you. Um, this is a really excellent resource that can be downloaded for free. And it's a nice uh, resource from the World Health Organization that outlines social determinants of health in a paper series. And so this entire publication in the series is de devoted to various social determinants of health. What I like about this resource is that it explores themes that are related to different strategies that we can use, how we think about governance, uh, how we think about tools as well as capacity building, not only to acknowledge that these social determinants exist, but also how we can use um, these to address uh, the determinants themselves as a way to improve health equity. So Kate, I'm having some trouble advancing this slide. If you're able to um, move it forward maybe two, that would be uh, helpful to me. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what we're now going to do is a brief kind of self-assessment just to see how folks are doing with the comp content that I just covered. So I've got some poll questions that are embedded throughout our presentation, and I'm going to launch the first two now. So what I want you to do is kind of read through the question, um, answer it, and then we'll talk about it if there are questions. Some of the information that is on the slide you might not be able to see all the way, and so I'm actually going to read them out loud just to, to help those attendees um, who might have trouble seeing it. So. Um, uh, the first question, if we could actually go back a slide, um, is the question about which of the following statements is false? Question one, there we go. So uh, choice A is mortality rates from chronic diseases have increased in the last 100 years. Choice B, in 1900, uh, the leading causes of death were infectious disease. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, that's choice C. Uh, choice B is mortality from infectious diseases declined between 1990 and 2010, 
so a couple of words cut off there, sorry. And then choice D, in 2010, the leading causes of death were infectious diseases. So there's kind of a character limit, so you might not be able to read all the uh, options there, but hopefully you'll be able to come with a, uh, a conclusion based on those options there. So choice A, B, C, or D, which of the following statements is false? Okay. Did it okay, share? great. Awesome. So I see it here. So it looks like a, a, a sizable chunk of you responded to the question. Terrific. And uh, most of you are correct. The correct answer is choice D. Uh, it is false because in 2010, the leading causes of death were chronic diseases, not infectious diseases. So the correct answer, the false statement of these four choices is uh, the one that most of you did correct on, which was the leading causes of death were infectious disease in 2010. That is, in fact, uh, not correct. That is false. Why don't we move forward to question number two? And so this question uh, asks, which, which of the following is not an example of a health disparity? So choice A says low-income individuals experience more barriers to care and receive poorer quality care than higher-income individuals. Choice B says lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals are more likely to experience challenges obtaining care than heterosexuals. Choice C, Hispanic women are as likely to have liver cancer as non-Hispanic white women. And then finally, choice D, stomach cancer incidence and mortality rates are twice as high in men as in women. So if you could select your choice between those four options. Okay, so this one actually got a little bit uh, interesting. Okay, so the correct answer is C, Hispanic women are as likely to have liver cancer as uh, non-Hispanic white women. But a sizable chunk of you actually thought it was choice D. So remember, when we're talking about health disparities, it's evidence of some type of difference that is experienced between groups. Choice A certainly demonstrates a difference uh, that the fact that lower income individuals have more barriers to care than higher income individuals. So it's, that, is, that is certainly an example of a health disparity. Choice B, LGBT individuals are more likely to experience challenges getting care than their heterosexual counterparts. That again also is an example of a disparity. Choice D, stomach cancer incidence and mortality is twice as high in men as what it is in women. That also is an example of a disparity. The correct answer is C because there is no difference between the groups. Choice C says that Hispanic women are just as likely to have liver cancer as non-Hispanic women. And so therefore, choice C is the correct response for this question because it is not an example of a disparity because it's not evidence of a difference. It's actually saying that Hispanic women have the same rates of liver cancer as do their white counterparts. Okay, so I'm glad that this is a really nice feature of being able to put in these questions, not only because it helps to, in real time, assess your learning, but it also allows me to go back and then clarify to make sure that the, uh, those of you who struggled with the question now have a better understanding of that material. So why don't we now then move forward and move to uh, number two, part two of the uh, first half of our uh, lecture here. And so what we're going to now be going through is the social ecological model. We'll then move on to theories of change that really help us to understand mechanisms um, of action when we're talking about social behavioral sciences. So, Kate, if you're able to advance the slide for me, that would be uh, super helpful. Awesome. Okay, so what you see here, and, and for those of you who are either MPH students or maybe uh, those of you who have taken some classes uh, and in their uh, near uh, past, you probably are familiar with the social ecological model. Um, this slide shows how we think about various determinants that can influence both health and disease. And what you see here is the nesting of these five levels. And so if, let's kind of walk through these. So we'll start with the smallest level and the innermost part of the nesting, which is that purple level. And so the, the social ecological model argues that we need to first think about kind of individual level influences. So th those are things about our genes or our biology, but also our knowledge and our attitudes, our behavioral skills, and how those all play a part in influencing our health status and also our disease patterns. 
That individual level is nested within the next level, which is the blue one, and that is the interpersonal level. Those are influences that occur between people and certainly can include things like social support and social norms that can involve not only your family but also your friends and your peers. So that blue level of the interpersonal um, levels is embedded then within organizations, which is represented by the green box here. So those organizational level factors include rules and policies and norms that occur within organizations. So a school or a workplace are examples of an organization that then can have some rules and regulations in place that operate at the institutional level, at that organizational level. That green box is then certainly nested within the community level, which is the orange box represented here. And this includes relationships that uh, people have between community networks, between and among organizations, as well as kind of those broader, kind of uh, more social norms that occur at the community level. And then finally, the outermost layer, the outermost nest of the social ecological model is what we call the policy level. So those are uh, considered macro level forces, things like societal norms, uh, state, national, even local laws, economic or social policies that all kind of operate at that, that macro level rather than the micro level. So the central assumptions about the social ecological model is first the idea that there's a multi-dimensional focus on both the physical and the social environment. So it includes things like the geography, architecture, culture, uh, behavioral settings, economics. There also is a focus on personal attributes, so what your genes are, what your biologies, um, psychological characteristics of individuals and the uh, associated behaviors and individuals all kind of work together. Um, the, another central assumption about the social ecological model is that it involves the degree of fit between a person's biology, their behavior, and the social and cultural needs, and the environmental resources that are available around them. So, the key principles of the social ecological model are listed here on the left-hand side of the screen, and so I just want to uh, re-emphasize these. So the first is this: there are multiple factors that influence how people behave when it comes to health, and that these influences interact between and across all of these five levels of the model itself. Consequently, the best way to get the biggest bang for your buck is to develop multi-level interventions to be the most effective. Just focusing on uh, an individual level knowledge, it may not be enough to be able to um, create some type of um, uh, action-oriented change when it comes to overall health and well-being. And then fourth and finally, that last kind of key principle of the model is that most uh, most oftentimes the intervention will be most powerful when it's behavior specific. So it's not a kind of general um, kind of ideology, but it's something that is uh, very particular to a, uh, to a specific behavior. So I'm going to walk through each of these four key assumptions using an example, and I'll pull it from the HIV testing world. So in the United States, we know that there are between 45 to maybe 48,000 new HIV infections every single year in this country, and that incidence has been relatively stable over the last decade or so. However, we know that between 16 to 18 percent of people who are HIV positive are unaware of their status. They have not been diagnosed and they don't know that they have HIV. And so consequently, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have prioritized increasing the number of people who know their HIV status. So logically, how do you know your HIV status? Well, you have to get a test. The way that we fight, figure out if you uh, have, uh, have HIV is you get screened for uh, uh, the test itself, by getting a test itself. And so let's walk through these four key principles on the left-hand side of the screen. So first, multiple factors on specific health behaviors. Well, with HIV testing, an individual has to have knowledge about HIV, they have to have a pretty positive attitude towards testing, and they need to believe that the behavior is going to lead to an appropriate diagnosis. So you want to be thinking about what their knowledge and attitudes and beliefs are, not only about HIV, but about testing, and then providing them opportunities and skills to be able to then get the test. So now you can get an HIV test, for example, over the counter, you can buy it online and, and do it in the comfort and privacy of your own home, for example. So Again, this idea that there are multiple factors influencing the health behavior. 
The second key principle has to do with the fact that these factors uh, interact across multiple levels. So even if you um, know what the HIV risks are, if you're not aware of HIV testing options, maybe that demonstrates a need for change at a community level. So maybe communities need to increase options to provide mobile testing, or maybe even changing community norms about testing, making it that it's, it's less stigmatized and more socially appropriate to know your HIV status, and that it's not this hidden taboo thing to go through an HIV test. The third piece is that there are multi-level interventions should be most effective at behavior change. This gets at the idea that just because we build it doesn't mean they're going to come and get tested. So just because we have testing options available at doctor's offices and in mobile clinics and that you can get it at a pharmacy or at your local grocery store, that doesn't necessarily mean that people will get tested. And so we need to think about doing interventions that operate at, at more than one of these levels and kind of simultaneously. And then finally, models uh, that we use should be behavior specific. So it's really critical that we identify the most relevant potential influences at each of the five levels. So perhaps making a policy level change about uh, requiring testing, for example, is one way we can think about how these macro level factors play a part. So it's not just about changing an individual's knowledge and attitudes. It's not just about changing community norms. It's thinking about uh, behavior specific change in the context of identifying those most relevant influences at each of these levels. Okay, so now I've given you kind of the nuts and bolts of what the social ecological model is. What I thought we could do now is kind of walk through uh, an example in terms of colorectal cancer screening. So this slide demonstrates the use of the social ecological model as a framework for addressing cancer. Um, this is a nice kind of resource guide for you when we're thinking about reviewing those multiple levels of influence and the determinants that operate at each of the five SEM levels. Um, so as you would imagine, that intrapersonal kind of individual level of influence, some of the factors that would um, you would want to think about in terms of facilitating behavior change include things like increasing someone's knowledge and improving their attitudes about the need for screening, for example. At the next level of the model, the interpersonal level, um, if a healthcare provider pr uh, recommends you getting screened for colorectal cancer, then that would likely facilitate behavior change. At the organizational level, an example of that would be something like a reminder system. So having some type of um, cue system, whether it's a, uh, a reminder email that you get or something that's uh, delivered in your online patient portal through your doctor's office to say, hey, it's time for your you know, periodic screening for colorectal cancer, for example. At the community level, this can involve uh, things that are happening at um, uh, just at the general uh, community level in terms of increasing awareness. So whether these are billboards or other educational campaigns to increase knowledge um, at the broader community level about the importance of screening behaviors. And then finally, it's the policy level. It's that uppermost nested level of the social ecological model. An example of that would be having an insurance mandate to say that colorectal cancer screening tests are covered. And so having that policy level decision in place so that you've uh, essentially um, facilitated the behavior change by removing one of the perceived barriers that people might have. Okay, so we're, we've done a nice kind of overview of the social ecological model. What I now want to move to is the third component in part one, and that's talking about different uh, theories of change. So clearly, we know that there are more theories of change, but in the interest of time, I can't cover them all in the, in the, uh, in the time we have today in the webinar. But I've kind of highlighted three or so, three to four um, theories, and those are uh, often the ones that are off, most often the part of, of public health curricula. So I've got three at the individual level, uh, four at the interpersonal level, and then finally four at either the community slash organizational level. Before we get th go through and kind of walk you through each of these theories, I want to make sure we review briefly what a theory is and why we use it. So a theory is really a set of interrelated concepts definitions and propositions that present to us a very systematic view of how we see events and how we see situations. Theories specify the relationships between variables in order to usually do two things, either explain the events or the situations or predict in the future such events or situations. So from a uh, public health standpoint, theories really help us in how we plan, implement, and ultimately evaluate interventions. They help us answer questions such as why, what, and how. 
So a theory could help us answer the, the why question, well, why are people not following advice to engage in healthy behavior? Why is it that people don't um, get enough exercise of what the recommended, recommended levels are? In terms of answering the what question, what do we as public health professionals need to know before we develop an intervention to increase physical activity, for example? In terms of the question about how, how should programs and strategies be shaped to effectively reach people and organizations to effectively uh, impact their health behavior choices? And then another example of a what should be, you know, what do we really need to monitor? What should we be evaluating? Uh, what should we be measuring when we're determining whether or not a program was successful or not? So when we use theories of behavior change, we almost always start with the problem. We start with the behavior, uh, we start with the health issue, we start with the disease status. And the second step that we do is we identify determinants of that uh, behavior that are known. And then we also identify or we kind of predict what some suspected determinants might be. And we use those to map the determinants onto specific theoretical constructs or just general theories in and of themselves. After we map those, after we kind of connect the dots and map those determinants to the theory, we make decisions about how to develop and then implement some type of intervention strategy. In doing so, we think about how we're going to deliver the intervention, who will be the person that's delivering it, kind of the where and when we deliver it, and also kind of the nuts and bolts of the, the content of the program itself. So I want you to really be thinking about those steps as we use theories. Start with the problem, start with the health behavior, identify the known and suspected determinants, map those determinants to a particular theoretical model, and then make a decision based on how we can use that theoretical framework to develop and implement an intervention. So in terms of the theories of change that we'll talk about briefly today that focus on in, uh, within individuals, we use these to try to better understand and then ultimately change individuals' health behavior. So you're really focusing on the behavior, the beliefs, the attitudes, knowledge, previous experiences, and also how ready somebody is to change. So even if you were to think about something like, you know, flossing behavior, um, that's a health behavior change that we might want to make in somebody. We need to think about what are, what are their beliefs about using dental floss? What are their attitudes towards it? Do they think it's gross? Um, what's been their previous experience? If they've had a not so good experience with flossing in the past, they might not be so keen on trying to um, to start the behavior change. And then also in terms of knowledge, do they, do they believe or do they have knowledge to, to understand uh, the, the importance of doing uh, daily flossing regimen as part of their uh, recommendation from their dentist, for example. The first theory that we're going to talk about at the individual level is what's called the health belief model. And so really the focus of this particular theory is that an individual's beliefs are key determinants of behavior. And so this particular theory is what we call a value expectancy theory. So the expectancy is that the person believes that increased effort is going to lead to increased performance. And so the, the value that they place on it has to do with how much they value the reward or the outcome that is experienced after they do a behavior. So think about it this way. Based on these assumptions, people should desire to avoid sickness, avoid illness, and actually stay healthy, right? Stay well. And so people believe that a particular health action that's available to him or her is going to help prevent illness or prevent disease or disability. The major theoretical constructs you see kind of on the, on the uh, center part of this slide, and so let's kind of walk through this. So uh, the major constructs first include perceived susceptibility. So how likely do you think you are to contract a particular disease or to have a particular health issue? Perceived severity is how serious of a problem you think the health issue is. So those two components are nicely connected. The susceptibility and the severity are all about their beliefs about the particular condition or disease. Third and fourth, you have the perceived benefits and barriers. So the benefits are, you know, how well does the recommended behavior reduce the risk that's associated with that particular health issue? And then the perceived barriers, what are the potential negative aspects of doing this recommended behavior change? 
So let's think about this and maybe in the example of, of physical activity and obesity. With the perceived susceptibility and severity, it's how, uh, how um, likely they think they are to um, be obese and how serious of a problem they think obesity is. With the perceived benefits and barriers, how well does maybe engaging in uh, nutrition, healthier eating and uh, regular physical activity reduce the chance that they're going to develop obesity? And what are the barriers? So what are the perceived negative aspects of, of engaging in uh, greater physical activity and improving your nutritional intake as a way to support uh, obesity. Uh, five and six of the constructs include cues to action and self-efficacy. Cues to actions are factors which cause you to change or want to change. Um, so those are really strategies to activate your readiness to, uh, to make a behavior change. Self-efficacy is all about confidence. So self-efficacy is one's conviction that they can successfully execute a behavior that is required to produce a particular outcome. So I really think that as the health concerns of our country and even our planet have shifted to more lifestyle-related conditions, I think self-efficacy has really taken on greater importance, both as an independent construct but also as a component of the health belief model. Um, the nice thing I think about health belief model is that it's been applied uh, um, comprehensively across a wide variety of health behaviors. So we see the application of this particular model in preventive health behaviors, things that are health promoting like diet or exercise, uh, things that are health risk behaviors like smoking, even things like vaccination, uh, contraception use, things like that. Uh, the model has also been applied for sick role behaviors, so how well patients comply with recommended regimens uh, from their doctor, so even things like uh, you know medication regimens, for example, and those usually follow the um, a diagnosis of an illness that someone might have. And then finally, we see the application of the health belief model in clinic use. So um, how well do people comply with uh, doctor visits uh, after they've received a diagnosis, for example. Um, so again, this is kind of a nice uh, quick overview of one of the key theories of change that focus on uh, factors within an individual. The second theory that we're going to talk about is the theory of reasoned action. So the focus of this particular theory is not on beliefs, but on attitudes, and that those are the key determinants of behavior. Um, the theory of reasoned action was designed in the mid-1960s, and is really trying to figure out how we can explain intention for a behavior that a person may have a high degree of control in actually performing. So as a consequence, it includes measures of attitude and social normative perceptions that then consequently determine a behavioral intention. And if you have the positive behavioral intention, that should in turn affect behavior. So that's what you see kind of outlined on the, the top of the screen where you have those boxes and arrows. So you've got the attitude toward the behavior, the subjective norm, and then the perceived uh, behavioral control. All three of those influence the level or the intensity of the behavioral intention, and then consequently that intention leads to behavior change. So some of the um, key assumptions of this particular theory is that behavior, of course, then results from intention, that individual motivational factors determine the likelihood of performing a particular behavior. The, another key assumption that's important to recognize is that individuals are seen as rational actors and really a focus on cognitive uh, factors, things about how you, uh, what your beliefs are, what your knowledge is, and that those really determine one's motivation, one's motivation uh, to have a behavioral intention. So on the uh, kind of the left-hand side of the image there, you see those five boxes of those key constructs. Let's kind of walk through each of these so you understand what they mean. So behavioral intention is all about the perceived likelihood of performing a behavior. The attitude toward the behavior is the evaluation of the behavior itself. Subjective norms are all about other people. So this is the belief about whether most people approve or disapprove of a behavior. Behavioral beliefs are the belief that uh, doing a, a given performance of a behavior is then consequently associated with certain attributes or outcomes. The evaluation piece is the value that you attach to the behavioral outcome or attribute. The normative beliefs are uh, whether or not uh, most people either approve or disapprove of the behavior. And then finally, the motivation to comply. How motivated are you to comply with or agree with what uh, people around you think you should do, whether that's your spouse or your partner, whether that's your doctor. Your motivation to comply is all about um, your um, kind of intrinsic motivation to do what other people think you should do.
Now the trans theoretical, uh, sorry, the uh, theory of reasoned action uh, changed names and was modified in the 1970s and tra changed over to the theory of planned behavior. Three additional constructs were added, and so you see those kind of in the the blue boxes, bluish purple boxes on the bottom of the slide. Um, those three pieces include control belief. So this is the perceived likelihood of each facilitating or constraining condition actually occurring. Perceived power, so this is the perceived effect of each condition in making the performance either difficult or challenging or easy. So it's really the idea of how likely will each condition make the behavior change difficult or easy to actually carry out and perform. And then finally, the third additional construct is the perceived behavioral control. So how much control do I have over the behavior itself? Let me give you an example of this in the context of, of um, smoking. So if you think about it in this way, if I try to quit smoking, you know, that's the kind of the goal that I have. The consequence of that is going to, I'm going to have withdrawal. I'm going to have this withdrawal uh, feeling uh, as being uh, uh, kind of a negative consequence, and that's going to be difficult to deal, deal with. So why should I even try to quit smoking in the first place? So again, this theory is really trying to explain intentions for behaviors that people may have a high degree of control in actually performing. We're now going to walk through the third and final theory of change at the individual level, and that's the trans theoretical model. So while the first two theories that we talked about, the health belief model and the theory of reasoned action, are what we call continuum theories, the trans theoretical model, on the other hand, is what we call a stage theory. So this is, uh, has a very clear systematic approach to how we define different stages that people go in, and the ordering of the stages is also quite clear. Uh, the idea is that um, Behavior change is a cyclical process, and if we don't acknowledge that uh, and acknowledge that there are different barriers between stages, this might lead to our understanding of why people may not engage in behavior change at the rate or the intensity that we might like them to. So the basic premise behind this particular model is that an individual's readiness to change is the key determinant of behavior. So it's not like the health belief model was all about belief. The theory of reasoned action was all about attitudes. This model is about readiness to change. How ready is somebody to actually make a behavior change uh, as, a, as a kind of a key piece here? There are five primary stages for the trans theoretical model. So the first one will start at the top of the slide, which is the pre-contemplation stage. If someone is in the pre-contemplation stage, they have no intentions of changing their behavior in the next six months. Uh, the next stage is what we call contemplation. So this is a little bit different. People are actually starting to think about changing, and they want to do it in the next six months. Someone moving into the third stage, which is called preparation, this is when they're committed to change. They've thought about it. They're really committed to do it, and they're going to do it in the next 30 days. Uh, the fourth stage is what we call action. People in the action stage have actually put the decision into practice, and they have made the change, but it's relatively short term. It's only been within the last six months. And then the fifth and final stage is what we call maintenance. These are when people have made the behavior change and they've been able to sustain it uh, at least six months. So let's give an example from physical activity. Someone in the pre-contemplation stage, we would ask the question, you know, are you interested in trying to engage in physical activity? And if they say no and not in the next six months, they're certainly in pre-contemplation. Someone who is in contemplation might be thinking about being physically active soon, but not uh, anytime immediate, uh, whereas someone in preparation is ready to plan about how they want to become physically active in the next month or so. Someone in, in the action stage is actually in the process of beginning a physical activity plan, um, but it's in the early stages again, it's been within the last six months. And then finally, somebody in the maintenance stage is uh, remaining physically active for six months or longer. Research generally tends to show that populations tend to be at the lower levels, uh, the lower stages of change, and so the idea behind using this model is that you identify an individual's readiness to change, and then you match an intervention strategy based on their stage of, of readiness. So the trans theoretical model really has this temporal dimension, and it provides a framework for how we understand and how we can segment an entire process of intentional behavior change. So it's really about motivation to make a change as based on your stage of readiness, and that people tend to move through these stages of change. So it, uh, the idea behind it is that it proposes a predictable pathway for behavior change. 
Okay, so we're done with the uh, at the individual level. We're now going to talk about a couple of theories that focus on a change in relationships. So this is at the interpersonal level. So uh, really thinking about social relationships as influencing health and how we can use those uh, to our advantage when we're thinking about public health strategies. So I'm going to start here with the um, the social cognitive theories, the first of the interpersonal theories that we'll talk about. So the focus of this one is that really learning processes uh, are the key determinants of health. Some of the key assumptions of this theory include the fact that people are not passive learners. They learn by observing others. Um, another key assumption is people can anticipate the outcomes of behavior, and they can also self-regulate their behavior. Uh, finally, it's, this particular theory recognizes that the environment plays a significant role in determining one's health status and their interest in making a behavior change. What I've highlighted here at the bottom of the slide is reciprocal determinism. This is really a key element of this particular theory. Reciprocal determinism is all about the dynamic interaction between a person, a behavior, and the environment. And so the person is really this, an individual's thoughts, feelings, their personality, their knowledge, beliefs, even their values and attitudes towards something. The behavior is what a person says or what a person does. And then that third piece, the third element of reciprocal determinism is the environment. Think about this as having both a physical environmental context but also a social context. The idea behind reciprocal determinism is that if you change one of those three components, that should cause change in the other two. So you've got the person, the behavior, and the environment. And if you change one of those three, that should lead to, consequently, a change in the other two. So interventions, really, that are using the social cognitive theory should consider, really, uh, the idea of multiple avenues to behavior change, including environment, uh, behavioral skill, and personal change. Um, briefly, I want to mention this idea of environment. I, I said earlier that this includes both a social and a physical component, uh, but think of environment as any factor that is external to the person. It can include, as I said, both the physical environment and the social environment. So the physical environment can be things like facilities, room size, uh, temperature. It can include our natural environment, such as you know trees and, and forests and waterways and such. It can also include our built environment, so things like um, sidewalks and bike paths and things like that. When we think about the social environment, that can certainly involve people in our uh, kind of our classic social network, so our family members, our friends, our peers. It can also include things like our coworkers and uh, factors within our environment. So again, our environment is both a, com a combination of both social and uh, physical components. It provides an opportunity for social interaction. Um, it involves uh, how we think about ways we can modify our environment to support the positive behavior change, but also to inhibit negative behavior change. The second theory that we're going to walk through is what we call social support or social network theory. One of the key functions of social relationships is that they often provide social support. So if you think about maybe your best friend from high school or uh, your roommate in college or maybe your sister or family member, that social support is the aid and the assistance that's exchanged through that social relationship, through that interpersonal transaction that you have with your friend or with your sister. There are different types of social support that we talk about in this particular theory, uh, and there are kind of four basic categories, the first of which is emotional support. So this can be things about empathy, love, caring, and trust. And so let's say your sister, for example, is um, needs to have a mammogram, and, and if you're providing emotional support to you, you can provide a kind of uh, a kind handwritten note or some type of uh, empathetic statement to her, kind of sharing your um, uh, thoughts about the fact that you care for her and that you love her. That's in a form of emotional support. For instrumental support, this is all about tangible aid and services that directly assist the person who's in need. So for example, this from the uh, mammogram example, I can give a ride to the doctor's office to my sister when she needs to go get her mammogram done. So I'm providing a, a tangible uh, support to her because I'm instrumentally driving her over to her doctor's visit to be able to get her mammogram. Informational support is the third type of social support. This can include advice, suggestions, and information that a person can use to address their problem. So let's say my sister gets a, a positive mammo and she doesn't really know what that means, uh, but I have a friend who maybe um, 
uh, also got a diagnosis uh, recently, I can connect the two of them together and so they can maybe exchange texts or phone calls to provide some advice and suggestions about maybe getting a second opinion or going to a different doctor and such. And so it's using um, advice or suggestions as a form of information to help my sister address her problem. The fourth type of social support is what we call appraisal support. This, so this is all about feedback and appraisal information that people can use for self-evaluation. So in other words, think about appraisal support as constructive feedback and affirmation. So for example, going back to the mammogram example, after my sister gets her mammogram, I can give her some constructive feedback, you know, hey, I'm really proud of you, Mimi, for going and getting your mammogram. I think it's really great that you did that. You uh, prioritized your health and you took the right step forward. Um, I bet my sister or had no idea I'd be using her on this uh, <laughs> this webinar, but I am because I think it really provides a nice example of how we can really think about relationships between individuals and how the nature of the relationship that I have with my sister can influence her health behavior choices. Okay, so the next theory that we're going to talk about here is what we call stress and coping theory. So the focus on this interpersonal theory is all about how people cope as a key determinant of health. Uh, the theory was originally developed to examine how people appraise and cope with a wide variety of stressful encounters, and this can range from you know, kind of minor daily hassles like you know sitting in traffic on your commute home today, um, to major life events like a um, a diagnosis of cancer or the tragic death of a loved one, for example. We define stressors as demands made by either the internal or our external environment that upset our balance. Uh, and they consequently then affect our physical and psychological well-being. And they require some type of action on our part to help restore that balance. So one's coping represents how a person adapts to a stressor. Um, there are both opportunities and needs to apply theory on stress and coping to both emerging and contemporary public health issues. So even things like natural disasters or hurricanes, like Hurricane Matthew that hit uh, last year, or even uh, other acts of terrorism or mass traumatic events. So even a couple of days ago, the uh, nightclub attack that happened on New Year's Day in Istanbul, we can think about the use of a stress and coping theory as a way to think about this this kind of person environment transaction and how an external uh, stressor has been imposed on someone. So we're kind of in the uh, gearing up for the last section here uh, oh, uh, where we're on uh, the stress uh, interpersonal theory of social influence theory. Um, so these, this idea is that this particular theory at the interpersonal level can be used for either the creation of new behaviors, the reinforcement of existing behaviors, or even behavior change in and of itself. When you're using social influence theory, you need to think about the communicator. Who is the source of the influence uh, that's being uh, shared? What is the message? What is the communication? that's being exchanged, what is the channel of how it's being delivered, who is the target audience that's kind of the recipient of the message, and then finally, what is the situation in which the, uh, the message is presented. So the idea here is that oftentimes with this particular social influence theory, people who are perceived as uh, uh, respected or valued or considered an expert, um, you're more likely to have behavior change with that. So with a patient-provider communication, uh, if a patient respects and values their healthcare provider's opinions and suggestions for behavior change, they are more likely to actually engage in the behavior change. So if your doctor says to you, you know, you should really avoid alcohol consumption, because we know that it interacts with the effectiveness of the medications that you take for your diabetes, the social influence of the healthcare provider can have a meaningful impact on whether or not the patient actually changes his or her alcohol consumption. And so again, the social influence theory is all about using communication as part of either a formal or an informal interpersonal relationship. Again, thinking about who the communicator is, what the message is, and how, uh, and, uh, how they're exchanging the information and who the target audience is that's actually receiving the information. Okay, so that's the final theory that we have at the interpersonal level. I'm now going to move through the final four theories uh, that are focused really on the organization and on communities. And so these are useful when we're thinking about how we can change the, the role of organizations and communities in both promoting positive health behavior change but also inhibiting uh, behaviors that are uh, less healthy. The first theory that we're going to talk through here is the organizational change theory. And so because uh, many behavior change programs occur in organizational settings, places like schools, work sites, clinics, 
we know that our organizational environment, both directly and indirectly, can affect one's health. So things like access to affordable, healthy foods in a cafeteria at your work site uh, is important. Another example of for people who are working uh, uh, with some type of occupational exposure, having protection plans in place, having protective gear that people can uh, wear as a way to prevent occupational exposure is another example of how we can think about things from an organizational setting. So given the importance of organizations in our everyday life, having policies and practices that exist in the organizational level are frequently the target of behavior change interventions. So the theory itself has a focus certainly on, on policies and practices within the organization as key determinants of health. There are two different approaches that's used. The first is the stage approach. The second is the developmental approach. And I'm going to walk you through each of these two to make sure that you understand them um, sufficiently. So with the stage approach, organizations pass through very specific uh, ordered steps as they change. And that the strategies that you use to promote change have to be matched based on various points in the change process. So this really explains how organizations develop new goals, new programs, or even new ideas. So the four stages uh, begin with the awareness of the problem. In the awareness stage, you're defining the problem and evaluating the solutions. So let's think about this in the context of a smoke-free work site. Um, the organization has to be aware that you know, a significant chunk of their employees are currently smoking, and that, though, that has health uh, consequences not only for the smokers themselves, but also from an environmental perspective of secondhand smoke. The second stage is what we call adoption. In the adoption stage, a policy is formulated and resources are allocated to start the change. So if the organization is thinking about becoming smoke-free, they now have created a, a written policy that all the um, employers are, employees are aware of and that there are resources allocated to start that change. So whether that's signage across the building to say that they're smoke-free, that can also include things like providing uh, resources to help people who are current smokers to quit. Um, the third stage is what's called implementation. Uh, in the implementation stage, you're actually the innovation itself is being implemented, and then the uh, the short-term reactions occur. And then finally, the final stage here is what we call institutionalizing. So when you're in that final institutionalization stage, the policy becomes so entrenched at the organization, the new goals are internalized, and it's just um, kind of common knowledge and acceptable fact that the the work site is now completely smoke-free. Second, let's walk through this developmental approach here on the bottom of the slide. So in the developmental approach of organizational change, this approach really tries to improve the quality of work life by looking at three different features. First is the organizational climate. So this is kind of the personality or the mood of the organization as a whole. The second is the organizational culture. These are kind of the assumptions or the beliefs that tend to be shared by organizational members, and sometimes they operate unconsciously. And then finally, organizational capacity. You want to have optimum functioning of all the subsystems within the organization itself. So really in the development approach, there's a process of con kind of continuous diagnosis and action planning, implementation and evaluation. And then there you have that overall goal of transferring that knowledge and the skills to the organization to really improve the capacity for problem solving, to be able to address kind of what, uh, what challenges they're being faced with. The second theory that we're going to talk about is what's called community organization theory. And in this, the uh, key determinant of health is the community organization itself and how we can build community capacity. So when you're using this theory at the community level, the idea is that you, uh, you work with the community members themselves to help identify and describe the health problems that exist worked kind of collaboratively and partnering with community organizations to mobilize resources, whether that's monetary or staff power or otherwise. And then you work with the community themselves as active partners in designing and implementing strategies to kind of reach the overall broad goals that the community has uh, as a whole. So usually when you're using this particular theory, you're thinking about, um, again, the, using the um, community building components as ways to address change. The uh, third theory at this level is what we call communication theory. So this is all about how we produce information and how we exchange that information between groups as key determinants of health. So whether this is mass media or social media, we're finding ways that we can provide information at the community level as a way to influence behavior change. A lot of this also involves uh, norms in terms of thinking about how can we um, recognize what individuals have concerns about in terms of uh, priorities when it comes to health, and then what are some strategies that we can use collectively to be able to address behavior change. 
The final theory that I'm going to walk you through at the organizational community level is what we call diffusion of innovation. So the focus of this particular theory is how can we kind of broadly, widespread, disseminate or share a successful innovation, and that's really the key focus for as a determinant of health. So when we talk about diffusion and innovation, let's talk about those two different terms. So diffusion in and of itself is a process. It's a special type of communication with messages about new ideas or, or new concepts. Diffusion uh, is really a process that occurs through certain channels over time among members of a social system. So I like to think about diffusion as a kind of social change. It's the process by which alterations occur in the structure of a social system as well as the function of a social system. So it might be helpful for you to think about dissemination as a planned kind of systematic effort designed to maximize reach and also maximize adoption of an innovation to be able to make that innovation more widely available. So the diffusion in and of itself is the outcome of the dissemination. I've been using this word innovation. You might be wondering, well, what the heck does she mean when she says innovation? Well, I tend to think of an innovation as either an idea, a practice, or an object that is perceived as new or different by an individual or the other unit of, of adoption. And so innovations can be hard. So they can be technological in place. So things like, you know, iPods or iPads, uh, DVD players, Fitbits, uh, even things like Velcro, those are hard innovations. They tend to be technological uh, in, in, um, in nature. Innovations can also be soft, so things like uh, representative government and democracy, uh, cooperative learning techniques. These are uh, much uh, less technological, they're less hard, they tend to be more soft, and they're more kind of conceptual ideas rather than um, something that is uh, something you can hold in your hand, per se. Uh, while the diffusion of public health innovations tends to be a relatively complex process, the relative advantage of the innovation is really critical to its diffusion. So you've got to demonstrate that the, effect is, uh, the effectiveness of the innovation itself is better than or it's, it's, it's improved upon whatever the alternative is. And so the more effective the innovation, the more it should be able to diffuse into organizations and communities. There are five primary stages within diffusion of innovation theory. So the first is awareness. First, you need to be exposed to the innovation, but you oftentimes uh, lack complete information. So you may have heard of it, but you don't really know kind of the nuts and bolts or the details, and that's where you're in the awareness stage. Second comes interest. You've got to have a sincere kind of interest in the new idea and learning more about it to be able to seek that additional information. The third stage is what we call evaluation. So this is where you kind of mentally, either as an individual or as, a, as an organization, you apply the innovation to, your, to the present situation, and then you also you can think about applying it to anticipated future situations to decide whether or not to actually adopt it. In stage four, you actually go through a trial period. So in trial period, you're making full use of the innovation, kind of in a short-term setting, just to see how things go. And then the fifth and final stage is what we call adoption. So this is when you decide to continue the full use of the innovation itself. So again, you've got five different stages from awareness, interest, evaluation, trial, and adoption. I thought it might be helpful to walk through an example of diffusion of innovation. And so let's examine, imagine that you know, a certain municipality is using the diffusion of innovation uh, for their various health clinics uh, in their community. The US Public Health Service uh, recommended uh, a couple of different things when we're thinking about HIV prevention, one of which is what's called pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is a prevention option for people who do not currently have HIV but are at risk of acquiring HIV. Before the uh, US Public Health Service uh, approved this uh, in 2012, few doctors actually reported prescribing this particular medication to their HIV negative patients who are at risk of acquiring the infection. And so we can really think about using diffusion of innovation as an example to think about how we can uh, create an opportunity for healthcare clinics to better uh, use PrEP for their patients who are at risk of HIV. So they can go through those stages of awareness, interest, evaluation, trial, and adoption as a way to use this innovation, PrEP, this biomedical kind of um, medication, thinking about that as the innovation, and then the diffusion is this process, how we can communicate the message about PrEP 
through uh, healthcare providers and then through particular community-based clinics to be able to increase uptake among their patient base that may be at risk of acquiring HIV. One other thing I wanted to share with you is this resource uh, that's available at the link provided uh, free. It covers a lot of additional theories beyond what I had time to cover in today's webinar, but it might be particularly useful for you to check this out as you're preparing for your exam. So I know we've gone through a big section here, and what I'd like to do uh, for the next uh, couple of minutes here is uh, go through three different poll questions that have to do with this second uh, section of today's um, webinar. And so uh, if we could launch the three poll questions here, we're going to start with um, a question about individual behavior change theory. So here's the question. Which individual level health behavior theory argues that behavior change is a process, recognizing that individuals uh, differ in their readiness to change? So your options are health belief model, theory of planned behavior, or a trans theoretical model. Okay, super, good. So most of you got this right. So trans theoretical model is the correct answer. And again, this is a, what we call a, a stage theory. We're recognizing that people are different in their readiness to change, whereas the health belief model and the trans, uh, theory of planned behavior focus more as a, a kind of a continuum theory. So the correct answer is C. Let's proceed now to uh, question four, our next question at this particular section. So which interpersonal level health behavior theory includes reciprocal determinism as a key element? So again, reciprocal determinism is this idea that there's a dynamic interaction between the person, the behavior, and the environment. So you have got four choices here at the interpersonal level. Awesome. Okay, correct. So social cognitive theory uh, does include a key element of, of uh, reciprocal de determinism. Again, dynamic interaction, interaction between person, environment, and behavior. So correct. With social cognitive theory, choice A. Okay. Last question here is about organizational community level theory. So which one includes stages of adoption, sorry, awareness, interest, evaluation, trial, and adoption? You have four choices listed here. Wonderful. Okay, correct. So the correct answer is diffusion of innovation. It's got these five uh, stages that organizations or communities go through as they're considering uh, the adoption of a particular uh, innovative uh, idea or uh, approach as they're moving forward. Excellent. Okay, so we're in the last section of part one. We've got about 11 or so slides to push through here, and then we'll take a nice 10-minute break, which I'm sure all of you are <laughs> looking forward to. So what we're going to now do is talk a little bit about different CDC frameworks for uh, uh, public health action. And so if we can move forward to the next slide here, um, the, um, what you see is, uh, oh, sorry, what we see first is we're going to do quickly some definitions from World Health Organization. So I, in the interest of time, I won't go through these, but this is really the basis of hippy dippy, what we call health promotion and disease prevention, HPDP. So these two uh, definitions are here, and they're very consistent with what we use in the United States in terms of, of how we define these. We'll use this, these uh, hippy dippy, the health promotion, disease prevention, as a context for how CDC really has established a framework for public health action. And so if we can proceed to the next slide, what you see is a health impact pyramid. And so CDC uh, talks about interventions at different levels of the social ecological framework, certainly, that we talked about earlier. But what you see here is that there's a clear preference for those that give you the biggest bang for your buck, in a sense. And so you see that arrow on the left-hand side of the screen. The largest impact are factors that are at the lower levels of the pyramid. And so uh, what you see then on the um, preference here is that the largest impact, those are really shown by the widest two levels at the bottom of the pyramid. The strategy examples at each of the levels of the pyramid are shown in green there on the right-hand side of the slide. So let's walk through each of these five levels. 
and we'll start here at the bottom. So the bottom tier of the pyramid represents changes in socioeconomic factors. So these are things like poverty reduction or improving your education. And these uh, tend to be referred to as the social determinants of health. These socioeconomic factors really help form the basic foundation of society, and so consequently they're perceived to have the largest impact from a public health perspective. As we move up the pyramid, the second tier represents interventions that change the environmental context. So this is really changing where we live and work and play. The idea behind uh, changes at this particular uh, level, this tier of the, of the pyramid, is that we need to make healthy options the default choice, regardless of someone's education or income or other societal factors. So the defining characteristic of this tier is that individuals would have to expend significant effort not to benefit from them. So for example, I think the classic one for this is fluoridated water. It's really difficult to avoid it when it's in the public supply. Not only does it improve your individual health by reducing tooth decay, it also provides economic benefit. It reduces health spending and reduces uh, losses from productivity. Other contextual changes that can create healthier defaults include improvements in road and vehicle design, so things like airbags, for example, um, or um, kind of safety features that we have in vehicles or in roads. Even things like the elimination of lead and asbestos exposure are other examples of contextual changes. Okay, but as we move up, the third level of the pyramid represents one-time or infrequent protective interventions that do not require ongoing clinical care. Um, so these generally have less impact than interventions represented by those bottom two tiers because they necessitate reaching people as individuals rather than collectively. So an example of that would be something like immunizations. The fourth level, as we move up, represents ongoing clinical interventions. So things, these are things like prescriptions for chronic conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, things like that. And then the fifth tier of the pyramid, way up at the top, represents those activities that are designed to help individuals rather than entire populations. And so consequently, you see things like counseling and education, um, things that have the smallest impact from a, uh, from a public health perspective. Now, I want to quickly walk you through different levels of prevention. What we talk about in social behavioral sciences are things like primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. And what I've provided here are some of the strategies in terms of their definitions, but also some examples. So let's start at the left-hand side. Primary prevention is all about preventing a disease, condition, or injury before it ever occurs. So you do this by preventing the exposure to the hazard that causes the, causes the disease by altering unhealthy or unsafe behaviors that can lead to a disease, or by increasing resistance to a disease or an injury should an exposure in fact occur. So a classic example of this would be something like airbags in, in vehicles. From a secondary prevention standpoint, this is all about aiming to identify a disease at its earliest stage and then consequently reduce the impact of the disease or injury by initiating prompt and appropriate disease management. So the way that we think about doing secondary prevention is by detecting and treating a disease or injury as soon as possible to be able to halt or slow its progress. And then we also want to implement programs to help return people to their original health functioning to be able to prevent long-term problems. So screenings are nice examples of that. So screening for lead exposure in teens or in, in, young, in young people is a nice example of a, a secondary prevention. Third, then, we've got pre tertiary prevention. And this is all about aiming to soften the impact of an ongoing illness or injury that tends to have lasting effects. So you do this by helping people manage their long-term, often complex health problems and injuries. So chronic disease management is a nice way to think about this. And you want to be able to improve as much as possible people's ability to function and their quality of life. So tertiary prevention is really all about focusing on reducing or minimizing the consequences of a disease once it's already developed. And your goal is to either eliminate, eliminate or at least delay the onset of complications and disability due to that given disease. Uh, and most um, kind of medical interventions that we think about would usually fall into the tertiary prevention category, which is why these strategies are considered in the blue box under the clinical services heading on the slide. So cardiac uh, rehab programs are a nice example of tertiary prevention. We're reaching people uh, after they have an ongoing illness or injury. Now, there's another kind of 
categorization that I want to make sure that you're thinking about in terms of how we do prevention based on different groups within the same population. So universal prevention strategies are designed to reach an entire population, like an entire school or an entire community, without regard to individual risk factors. And they're intended to reach a very large audience. So I'm going to give you examples for each of these three types of interventions from the fields of substance abuse. An example of a universal prevention strategy would be, uh, let's say, a substance abuse education program. You're using a school-based curricula for all kids within a school district. And so uh, let's say you do some posters at the school. Uh, you do some uh, health seminars maybe for uh, the parents of the schools. The reason why it's universal is that all members of the school benefit from the prevention effort, not just specific individuals or specific groups. The second type of prevention activity is what's called selective interventions. And these strategies target subgroups of a general population that have a higher than average risk. So again, an example from the substance use field, let's say you're going to do a mentoring program aimed at children of substance abusing parents or families who live in a high crime, uh, high impoverished neighborhood that has a higher than average substance use rate. So again, you're doing a selective intervention because you are um, particularly targeting subgroups that have a higher than average risk. Third, you've got indicated prevention interventions. And in these, you identify individuals who are experiencing early signs of risky behavior and other related problems, and then you try to target them with special programs. So let's say you're going to do a substance abuse program for high school students who are already experiencing a number of problem behaviors. Uh, you already know that they are um, abusing alcohol or maybe marijuana or other drugs. They may even have problems with truancy, uh, failing academic grades, those early signs of substance abuse. You're doing an indicated intervention with these people, with these uh, particular individuals who are experiencing early signs of risk behavior. When we do health promotion and disease prevention, it's very important that our programs are evidence-based. This is something that I mentioned to you, I think, on slide two. Our programs uh, in public health go through a vetting process with independent panels, and we want to make sure that we systematically review our interventions versus what's usual and customary to be able to demonstrate that the intervention, in fact, works, that it's efficacious. There's a wonderful free resource that's available to you called the Community Guide, which you see the link uh, listed on the bottom of the slide here. And this includes recommendations for public health interventions. Uh, the guide is organized by category, so it's everything from child car safety seats to diabetes care to immunizations. And it demonstrates the task force recommendations and findings. It also indicates if an intervention is recommended and whether the evidence is insufficient to make a recommendation. Uh, this is periodically updated by the CDC, uh, it's really a, a quite a valuable resource. So I encourage you to check this out as you prepare for your exam. Um, let's talk about what those evidence-based strategies might look like. Uh, if we go back to maybe slide seven or eight, I talked about some of the major risk factors as the actual causes of death in the United States. And so those four leading behavioral risk factors include tobacco, physical inactivity, healthy diet, and alcohol. And so from the community guide, I've pulled out some examples of evidence-based strategies to address these major risk factors. So let's just pull out maybe uh, one of these. Let's start with the top left with smoking. So we know smoking is a uh, leading cause of preventable death. About 400,000 people die every year from smoking-related consequences. Some examples of evidence-based interventions to address uh, smoking would include cessation programs, so um, helping uh, people who currently smoke to quit. The second is doing prevention programs in schools to be able to prevent kids from starting to smoke. Um, having access laws that limit uh, the ability to buy cigarettes if you are a minor. Uh, and then even at the higher level, kind of when we think about things that they kind of either the community or the policy level, having smoke-free environments, whether that's a workplace or a municipality, and also having taxes that are placed on uh, cigarette purchases. These are examples of evidence-based strategies, interventions that we know work to be able to address um, tobacco use. Again, what I want you to draw your attention to as you go through some of the others that are listed here in terms of alcohol, physical activity, and diet is that these recommended strategies span across various levels of the social ecological model. And so I think that's another important point here. So 
this is my final slide for this section uh, before we get to the uh, couple of poll questions. Um, there are some key principles that might be part of the exam that I certainly want you to be aware of as you're doing your preparation. And the first principle when we think about community health practice is the appropriate identification of stakeholders. You are often working in public health in collaboration with other community members and other community groups, and they become your partners. So your program sponsor, uh, decision makers, organizations, individuals are all affected by the program and they are considered stakeholders through the process. So when you're at work in a community, you typically put together an advisory board of stakeholders and there should be representation from each of the groups that are listed there on that bulleted point. So uh, uh, many years ago, I was working in central North Carolina with a group of uh, HIV prevention researchers, and we had an advisory board that oversaw several of our research projects. Importantly, that included um, some uh, organizations that represented people living with HIV, uh, that represented people who were uh, family members of people living with HIV. We also had uh, HIV positive patients themselves as part of our advisory board. It wasn't just about us as the outsiders coming in, and talking about how we're going to develop interventions and programs. We wanted to have those people who are actually directly benefited by our program be part of the decision making, and they were certainly key stakeholders uh, in our advisory board. Another key feature of community practice is community mobilization. So this is all about having a collective joint effort to increase awareness about a problem and be able to advocate for change. So again, it's not just the outsiders coming in uh, advocating for uh, change, but finding that mobilization within uh, the community itself. So oftentimes you have kind of champions or, or leaders who are interested and invested in a particular uh, health problem, and those can really be um, key individuals that mobilize uh, behavior change collectively. The third principle is community assessment. So before we can design an intervention, we need to really know the strengths and the challenges that are being experienced by the community. Uh, one of the resources that I found helpful when I was conducting a community health needs assessment uh, a couple of years ago in Northwest Mississippi uh, is that we actually used um, some publicly available data that was at low cost or no cost to us to really supplement the quantitative and qualitative data that we were collecting from surveys and focus groups and key informant interviews. And there's a data set from CDC, I provided the link here, to be able to look at some of the uh, behavioral risk factors, some of the other social environmental uh, indicators that were at play in the particular county that we were working in, in the Mississippi Delta. And so hopefully this, uh, this link that I've provided here will be able to help you when you're thinking about doing uh, getting some, uh, some basic community needs assessment data. We'll talk about uh, needs assessment more in detail in the second half after the break as well. The final principle that you want to think about when you're considering community health practice is that of what we call CBPR, community-based participatory research. So this is really a partnership approach to public health in terms of how we approach the research uh, that equitably involves community members and organizational representatives and the researchers in all aspects of the research process itself and where we value the opinions and the expertise of all the partners as we make shared decision making and shared ownership over public health programs. So some of the key elements of community-based participatory research include the following. First, you want to recognize that the community is your unit of identity. You're not just analyzing individuals one at a time, but your unit of identity from your public health program is the community collectively. Second, you want to build upon existing strengths and resources that already exist within the community. And then as a consequence, you use that to facilitate collaborative partnerships in all the faces of the research. So when the community members themselves feel like they are active participants, participants and that their, their opinions are valued and respected uh, in all the different phases of the research process, uh, that can really create a co-learning, kind of empowering process. Um, you want to make sure, finally, in terms of a key element of CBPR, that you're not only just collecting all the data and collecting all your findings, but you're finding an appropriate way for you to disseminate the uh, conclusions that you draw and the knowledge that you gained. Um, so it's not just about writing academic papers and getting publications out of this, but it's about thinking about ways that you can disseminate your findings to the community members themselves directly. Uh, this is really a key feature of uh, CBPR uh, that oftentimes I think gets undervalued or underappreciated. 
Okay, so now what I'm going to do is launch the final three polls, and then we'll take our 10-minute break. So the first question that we have here has to do with the health impact pyramid. So from the CDC pyramid, prescriptions for high blood pressure are examples of, your choices are A, counseling and education factors, B, clinical interventions, C, long-lasting protective interventions, or D, changing the context. So go ahead and uh, submit your response for that. Awesome. Okay, great. People did quite well on this. So exactly. So prescriptions for uh, treating chronic dis uh, diseases are certainly an example of a clinical intervention. Overall, nice job. Great. Okay, we're now going to move to question seven. Uh, question se seven is all about prevention. So promoting the use of sunscreen is an example of primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention, or treatment. Excellent. Okay, people did very well on this. You're right. So primary prevention is all about aiming to preventing a disease, condition, or injury before it occurs. And so, of course, the use of sunscreen is meant to prevent uh, skin cancer. Great. Okay, we'll move on to the last question for this section. That's question eight. Screening for hepatitis C virus uh, of patients with a history of injection drug use is an example of primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention, or treatment. Wonderful. Once again, great. Okay. Secondary prevention is the correct answer. So again, you're trying to identify a disease at its earliest stage and then reduce the impact of that disease by uh, initiating prompt and appropriate disease management. And exactly by screening people uh, with a history of injection drug use, that's a classic example of doing a screening intervention, which would fall as secondary prevention. Okay, so I, my clock here is at 2.35 p.m. We're going to take about a 10-minute break, and then we will regroup at 2.45 p.m. So um, take a moment to, for yourselves, and I'll uh, chat with you in about 10 minutes.
Okay, so I've checked the time here, and I see it's 2.45. Um, we're going to pick back up with the second half of this afternoon's presentation. Um, I've scrolled through the audience questions so far, and it looks like all of them have been sufficiently answered um, by Kate. So it looks like uh, m many of the questions have been about obtaining the PowerPoint slides, uh, and having a, a saved copy of the webinar, webinar available. And again, uh, just to reiterate, the presentation will be available online probably in about two or three days after the presentation is completed. Uh, so you can just go to nbphe.org within a few days, and you should be able to get everything you need. Uh, remember to, for those of you who may have joined late, I said at the beginning of the talk that if you have any specific questions or you need some clarification about any of the material that I've covered thus far or in the second half here, please don't hesitate to email me afterwards. Uh, my email address is mona, M-O-N-A, at buffalo.edu. And again, the entire presentation will be placed online for both viewing and listening uh, within two to three days. So what we're going to do now is uh, press forward with part two of uh, today's webinar. And we're going to start by covering the ethical issues that need to be explored as part of the planning and evaluation of public health programs. And then after we go through those ethical issues, we'll walk through some common planning models that are used in public health. Uh, many of those uh, are commonly used in public health curricula. And I think these will be the best way to help prepare you for your upcoming CPH exam. We'll then uh, continue on by covering evaluation methods. And we'll conclude today's webinar by covering scaling up programs as well as sustainability. So let's start uh, by moving forward with ethical issues in uh, planning and evaluation. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is give you a, a, a quite brief overview of some key points in history leading up to the Belmont Report. And that is a report that guides institutional research using human subjects as research participants. Um, frankly, some of the best ways I think we learn about ethics is about learning from our past mistakes. And so we're going to start through uh, with the 1930s and the Tuskegee syphilis study. But before we do that for the next couple of slides, let me quickly walk you through uh, some of these other major ethical developments that led to the Belmont Report in 1979. So uh, post-World War II, 1946, was the Nuremberg trial. Uh, this uh, trial resulted in the Nuremberg Code. So the, uh, the basis of this particular code is that there has to be voluntary consent of a human subject, and that is absolutely essential. Two years later, the United Nations adoption, adopted the Un Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is really a milestone document in the history of human rights. It was drafted by different uh, representatives that held uh, different legal and cultural backgrounds from all regions of the world. And uh, it was really has become a common standard for achievements for all people of all nations. It set out for the first time in history that fundamental human rights need to be universally protected. In 1963, another major ethical development was the Willowbrook study. So Willowbrook was a state-supported institution for children with intellectual disabilities in Staten Island, New York. Um, Unfortunately, it was one of the most unethical medical experiments ever performed in children in the U.S. And so this gets back to my point earlier about some of the best ways that we learn about ethics in public health is about learning from our past mistakes. In 1964, there was the Declaration of Helsinki. This was a set of ethical principles regarding human experimentation that were developed for the medical community by the World Medical Association, or WMA and is widely regarded as the cornerstone document of human research ethics. Um, the, all of those events I mentioned because, they, they again, they're really major ethical developments that led to um, the Belmont Report that promoted three key principles of human research ethics. So let me provide you with some background um, going back 80 or so years ago uh, to the uh, initiation of the Tuskegee syphilis study. So in 1932, uh, the U.S. Public Health Service, working with the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, began a study 
with the intent to record the natural history of syphilis in African Americans. Uh, the title of the study was called Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. When the study was initiated, there were no proven treatments or cures for syphilis. Uh, but syphilis at the time was known as bad blood. The study initially involved 600 men in Macon County, Alabama, uh, about 400 of whom had syphilis and 200 who did not have the disease. And the study was conducted without the benefit of patients' informed consent. Researchers essentially told the men that they were being treated for bad blood, uh, and that included uh, kind of these basic ideas about syphilis or anemia or fatigue. In truth, these men did not receive the proper treatment needed to cure their illness. Rather, in, in exchange for being part of the study, the men received free medical exams, they got free meals. Originally, the plan was to have this study um, occur for about six months, but in actuality, the study went on for more than 40 years. Over that 40-year period, the men were never told of the experiment. They were um, withheld a lot of information certainly, throughout the course of the study. Um, so the study was reviewed throughout that 40-year period, periodically, um, by U.S. Health Service uh, officials. And it was continually extended through that 40-year period based on the argument that stopping the study would interfere with the benefits to medical science of studying syphilis. Syphil uh, syphilis is actually uh, now treatable and curable. In 1947, penicillin became the drug of choice for syphilis. Uh, could cure the disease, and researchers intentionally withheld it from the research subjects in this particular study. So essentially a cure is available, but it was knowingly and intentionally withheld from men who could have benefited from receiving the treatment. As many as 100 men died of syphilis during the course of the study. When participants did die, uh, the researchers offered their family free burials in exchange for the right to do autopsies on their bodies so they could gather final data for the study. Oh, let me just go back one slide, my apologies. So there was a key whistleblower, a man uh, by the name of Peter Buxton. In 1966, he uh, sent a letter to the director of the Division of Venereal Diseases at the US Public Health Service and basically said, I've got a lot of concerns about the morality of this experiment. This is not something that's medically justifiable. Uh, the quote in his original letter included this um, statement, the excuses and justifications that might have been offered in 1932 are no longer relevant. Today, it would be morally unethical to begin such a study with such a group. Uh, he, uh, a few years later, in July 1972, an Associated Press story about the study caused public outcry that essentially led to the Assistant Secretary for Health and Scientific Affairs to appoint a panel to review the study. Uh, the panel uh, concluded that the men had agreed freely to be treated and examined. However, there was no evidence that the researchers had informed them of the study or of its real purpose. In fact, the men had been misled and had not been given all the facts required to provide informed consent. Further, the men were never given adequate treatment for their disease, particularly after uh, penicillin was discovered as a cure for syphilis. The advisory panel found nothing to show that the subjects were ever given the choice of quitting the study, even when this new highly effective treatment of penicillin became widely used. The advisory panel concluded that the, the Tuskegee study was ethically unjustified, that the knowledge gained was sparse when compared with the risks that the study posed for the research subjects. And so October of 1972, the panel advised stopping the study immediately. A month later, the Assistant Secretary for Health and Scientific Affairs announced the end of the study. Years later, in 1974, a uh, $10 million out-of-court settlement was reached. The U.S. government promised to give lifetime medical benefits and burial services to all remaining uh, participants who were still alive from the study. It took all the way until 1997 for a presidential apology, apology. So on May 16th, President Clinton apologized on behalf of the country. It's really kind of sad and, and unfortunate in so many ways that it took so many years for our federal government to apologize um, for such a tragedy uh, to have occurred in the name of research. In 2004, the last Tuskegee participant died. So I provide you with this background information about the Tuskegee study because, again, I think we learn a lot from our past mistakes when it comes to 
ethics. Scientific research has certainly produced substantial social benefits, but it has also posed some troubling ethical questions. And public attention was really drawn to these questions by the reported abuses of human subjects in biomedical experiments, not only at Tuskegee, but also during and after World War II. And so in 1974, Congress passed the National Research Act, creating the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. And really the primary goal of this commission was to identify basic ethical principles that we should use as we uh, to guide the conduct of the research that we do with human participants. The Belmont Report was created by the Commission and, and ultimately issued in September of 1978. It summarized three key ethical principles and provided guidelines for research involving human subjects. Those three core principles are identified and include respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. The three primary areas of application are also stated in the report, and they include informed consent, assessment of risk and benefits, and selection of subjects. So what I want to do quickly is just walk you through those three basic ethical principles. First is respect for persons, and that in fact has two parts. First, individuals should be treated as autonomous agents, and second, that persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. The principle of respect for persons thus divides uh, into these two separate moral requirements. So first the requirement is that you need to acknowledge autonomy, and the second requirement is that you need to protect those with diminished autonomy. So whether that is uh, minors or children, people with uh, intellectual disabilities, making sure that we've um, correctly uh, entitled, those individuals are entitled to protection. The second basic ethical principle is beneficence. So this is the idea that persons are treated in an ethical manner not only by respecting their decisions and by protecting them from harm, but also by making efforts to secure their well-being. So two general rules have been formulated as complementary expressions in this sense of beneficence. The first is the issue of do no harm, and the second is to maximize possible benefits and minimize possible harms. The third ethical principle is what we call justice. Who ought to receive the benefits of research and who ought to bear its burdens? Uh, this is ultimately a question of justice in the sense of fairness and distribution. As you know from uh, the last couple of minutes, the Tuskegee syphilis study used disadvantaged rural black men to study the untreated course of a disease that is by no means confined to that population. These subjects were intentionally deprived of effective treatment in order not to interrupt the research project, long after such treatment became generally available. Against this historical background, uh, we can really see how concepts of justice are relevant to research involving human subjects, right? So, for example, the selection of research subjects needs to be scrutinized in order to determine whether some classes of people are being systematically selected simply because of their easy accessibility or their comprised comp uh, position or because they're manipulable. Um, so, for example, if we only focus on a particular race or ethnicity group, or we only focus on people confined to a mental institution or to a prison system, um, we need to really think about justice. Who ought to receive the benefits of research, but also who, is, uh, who needs to bear its burdens? Um, so when we really need to be thinking about how we select research subjects, um, to think about the reasons that we pick them that are directly related to the problem that's being sub uh, studied, not because they're just simply convenient to us. The Belmont Report is really one of the leading works concerning ethics and healthcare research. It allows for the protection of participants, not only in clinical trials, but also in research studies. The report continues as an essential reference for institutional review boards uh, that uh, examine and review human research subjects' proposals in order to make sure that the research uh, that's being proposed meets the ethical principles of the regulations outlined by the Belmont Report. So I've provided here a few additional resources for your review. Um, the first is a uh, 
quick link uh, to Blad, Bad Blood, which is just a nice video kind of overviewing uh, the Tuskegee syphilis study. The second is the idea of deception and research from the standard, uh, sorry, Stanford prison experiment. And then the third is the idea of responsible conduct of research uh, with a link to a YouTube video. Um, it's got some funky music, I will tell you in advance, <laughs> but the content otherwise is really a, a nice, clear, and concise summary of how we do the responsible conduct of research with humans. What I now want to do is uh, launch uh, our next poll. So we're going to launch poll seven here. If you could uh, kindly read this question with me and then, and then answer it, we'll then move into some priority public health issues. So question nine states, the Belmont Report's core principles are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. In addition, the three primary areas of application are uh, choice A, informed consent, beneficence, harm reduction. Choice B, universality, justice, informed consent. C, universality, informed consent, selection of subjects, or D, informed consent, assessment of risks and benefits, selection of subjects. So take a moment to uh, respond to this question. Awesome. Okay, great. So um, the majority of you got this question correct. The answer is D. Uh, those of you who picked B and C, uh, universality is not a core principle or is it a, a primary area of application. So that is why those are incorrect. And for those of you who picked A, uh, remember there's a difference between the core principles and uh, there's a difference from the three primary areas of application. And so beneficence is part of the core principle, uh, but it is not a primary area primary uh, area of application. Uh, informed consent certainly is. So therefore, the correct answer is choice D. Okay. So now we're going to move on to cover planning models. Uh, I thought it would be helpful, though, to begin by reviewing that all planning is certainly initiated with some type of assessment about the strengths and weaknesses that are affecting a population, and then finding some way of prioritizing those issues and challenges confronting a population. So you can think about this at either a school, a workplace, a neighborhood, a municipality, even at the national or, or international level. So there's a process that we go through as we look at public health problems based on the magnitude of the key diseases, and then we use those to prioritize. So here's an ex two examples of priority public health issues. So what you see on the left-hand side of the slide is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's winnable battles. So they've identified seven priority issues at the national level that they consider to be winnable. Uh, these are high magnitude public health problems that fortunately have effective evidence-based interventions associated with them. So they include some that we've already talked about. So tobacco, nutrition, physical activity, and obesity, food safety, healthcare associated infections, motor vehicle safety, teen pregnancy, and HIV. So again, winnable battles, high magnitude public health problems, having effective evidence-based interventions associated with them. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see the Department of Health and Human Services major priorities for health disparities. Uh, these, set, uh, these are their clear uh, uh, priority areas that they've uh, identified. Infant mortality is there, as well as cancer screening and cancer management, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, HIV, and immunizations. And so I pre prevent, present these to you because I think it's important when we think about um, how we are uh, prioritizing the issues and challenges that are confronting a population, and then we go through these based on the, the magnitude of those key diseases to be able to prioritize. So that's not to say that something that's not uh, on this list of 13 is, is not appropriate to be uh, addressable, but it just identifies those priority areas that have been picked by two leading uh, federal agencies, the CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services. So the process that we go through at the national level when we're identifying uh, priorities for public health is what we call healthy people. So if we can advance to the next slide. Um, healthy people happens every 10 years since 1980. And so we are on the fifth iteration of healthy people right now. Um, the healthy people objectives are really the foundation for many federal prevention initiatives in public health. The goal of healthy people is to increase quality and years of life 
and eliminate health disparities by providing a nice kind of conceptual framework of those public health priorities. They also provide measurable objectives and benchmarks, which they can be used then to guide uh, local public health planning and to aid in how we monitor progress over time. Um, so really, they provide some benchmarks with each objective that can be used at the state level, but also at the local level. So you can monitor things as how, uh, how progress has been made over the previous decade. So local and uh, state agencies are able to answer the question, you know, are we making progress toward that benchmark that's been identified? Um, the far right hand of the part of the slide has Healthy People 2020. So this is a comprehensive set of 10-year national goals and objectives for improving the health of all Americans. Healthy People 2020 contains 41 topic areas, more than uh, several hundred objectives. Uh, there also is a smaller set of Healthy People 2020 objectives called Leading Health Indicators, and those have been selected to communicate high-priority health issues and actions that can be taken to address them. I really think it's a fun uh, slide to show when I do these webinars because it really highlights the growth of healthy people over the last 40 or so years. With each of the decades, as you move from left to right, you see uh, changes in number, right? So you can see from the first iteration back in 1990 that the number of topic areas has certainly grown as well as the number of objectives. And we're continuing that trend in the, in the current uh, version of healthy people that we're on. One of the primary reasons for the growth and is that new public health priorities come up, right? So part of the reason why you see more than a doubling of topic areas as well as the number of objectives is that new uh, priorities uh, come to the surface, things like emergency preparedness or healthcare-associated infections. Those are beginning to reach the level of national significance and they need to be monitored. They may not have existed back in 1990 or in 2000, for example. Briefly, I want to outline some key features of Healthy People. So first, again, to reiterate, they create, it creates a, a comprehensive strategic framework for how we can unite hippy-dippy, so the health promotion disease prevention issues under one single umbrella. Uh, Healthy People also requires tracking of data-driven outcomes in order to monitor our progress and motivate and guide uh, focused attention as we try to address some of the problems at the, the national level that we're facing. Healthy People encourages a network of multidisciplinary and multi-sectorial stakeholders at all the levels. So it's not just about the public health community. It's not just about public health working with the medical community. This is also how we can think about other infrastructure and economy and other areas of social sciences, certainly. And then finally, Healthy People establishes accountability requiring all public health service grants to demonstrate support for the Healthy People objectives that you see outlined here on the slide. Um, I've got one, uh, the next slide here I've gone is just to show you what uh, a little bit more of a, from a graphic perspective about what Healthy People 2020 looks like. And so uh, what you'll see here on the next slide is that Healthy People is not just about uh, the, these uh, four primary overarching goals, it's that the determinants of health uh, and the, uh, the important roles that they play in, in public health involve not only their physical environment but also the social environment. And there are issues with health services, things that have to do with access and quality, and individual behavior, biology, genetics. So that there's these determinants that you see on the left-hand side of the slide are all kind of working together, that they are not um, individual circles, but they are all kind of overlapping, all as consequential when we think about health outcomes for populations uh, and communities. And so this is something that's unique to the Healthy People 2020 that we didn't really see in previous versions, but I think it's, it's in a very important distinction. Okay, so now I want to talk to you with that uh, kind of backdrop about some of the major planning models in public health. So similar to my point earlier this afternoon about there being many different theories of behavior change, uh, similarly there are many different planning models that we use in public health. And so I had to be uh, quite a bit selective in the interest of time to be able to prepare you best for your exam during this webinar. But what I'm going to start with is what we call precede proceed. This is clearly one of the most well-known and widely used planning models. So I'm going to talk about that first. I'll then briefly go over a couple of other models and review some common elements that we see across planning models in public health. So Precede Proceed is a framework that was proposed in 1974 by Dr. Larry Green. The framework was proposed to really help public health program planners, policymakers, and evaluators analyze situations and then be able to design health programs efficiently based on that analysis. 
So it provides a clear, comprehensive structure for assessing health and quality of life needs, and then how can we design, implement, and then ultimately evaluate the programs to meet those needs. Um, so one of the purposes and really the guiding principles of this particular model is to work backwards. So it's directing your initial attention to your outcomes rather than your input. So it's kind of flipping things a little bit upside down, but I think it will make sense to you as you kind of walk through this. It really is guiding us through a process that starts with the desired outcome, and then you move backwards in the causal chain to identify the mix of strategies that would be necessary to achieve the objectives that you've identified. So it's called pre-seed, proceed because it has two distinct parts. So that's why there's a hyphen between the two words. Each of these uh, two parts has four phases. So we'll start with PRECEED. PRECEED is an acronym and that stands for Predisposing, Reinforcing, and Enabling Constructs in Educational Diagnosis and Evaluation. So again, first part PRECEED, four phases. Second part, PROCEED, four phases. PROCEED stands for Policy, Regulatory, and Organizational Constructs in Educational and Environmental Development. And so what you see here on the slide are the different components in each of those uh, first four phases of pre-seed. So social diagnosis is all about going to the community, figuring out what their wants and needs are when it comes to community health. The second phase is the epidemiologic diagnosis. This is where you identify the health behaviors and those factors at various levels of the social ecological model that influence the health outcome that's been identified by the community. And then you figure out, okay, which of those risk factors the, at the behavior level or at the social level are going to be easiest for us and most appropriate for us to be able to uh, make a change. The third phase is the educational and organizational diagnosis. This is where you identify all of those factors that can either facilitate or hinder you, you changing the behavioral factors that you've identified in the previous phase. And then fourth and finally, the last phase of pre-seed is the administrative and policy diagnosis. You identify and modify any of the, uh, the internal kind of issues or policies that are in place or even externally to be able to generate funding or other uh, resources that need to be allocated to do your intervention. So you go through these first four stages of pre-seed and uh, ultimately the results that you ga gather from steps three and four lead to your intervention plan, which is what proceed is all about. So what you see here in PROCEED are these final four phases. Stage five is what we call the implementation. So this is where you actually are starting up and conducting the intervention that you've designed. In phase six, you do a process evaluation. Are you actually doing the things that you said you were going to do? This phase is really used to evaluate the process by which the program is being implemented. It determines whether the program is being implemented according to your protocol and whether or not those early objectives are being met. It also helps you in, the, in terms of process evaluation, it helps you identify any needed modifications in order to improve the program. So it doesn't mean that you have to stick completely with it. If you realize that there are some tweaks or some changes that need to be made, that's when you do those adjustments in stage six. Phase seven is the impact evaluation. So you're answering the question, you know, does this intervention actually have the desired impact on our target population of interest? So you're measuring the effectiveness of the program with regard to those intermediate objectives as well as the changes in the predisposing, enabling, and reinforcing factors. And so oftentimes this phase is used to evaluate the performance of educators. Uh, phase eight, the last phase of PROCEED is what we call the outcome evaluation. So this answers the question, is the intervention actually leading to the outcome, the desired result that we had set forth that we envisioned way back when in phase one? Okay? So in phase eight, you're measuring the change in terms of your overall objectives as well as the changes in the, the health and the social benefits or the overall quality of life. And so in phase eight, you're determining the effect of the program on the overall health and quality of life of the entire community. And so that's your eighth and final phase. I provided a link here that might be uh, helpful for you to kind of walk through these eight phases of the model. But I thought uh, for those of you who like to see things visually, um, this is a really nice uh, slide that kind of overviews the, the four, first four phases across the top, which are pre-seed, and then the final four phases across the bottom, which are proceed. So if you move across uh, the top from, uh, from the far right, phase one, you're moving uh, backwards towards the left. You start in phase one with identifying those risks and protective factors. 
um, sorry, you started phase one with identifying the community needs, and then phase two is the risk and protective factors. Um, then in phase three, you're really figuring out, okay, what are some of those strengths that I have that we have, or the barriers that you might face when we're thinking about those factors from phase two, and then finally in phase four, you're figuring out what are the resources that we need to carry out the intervention. And then again across, now we're moving from left to right, from phase five over all the way to the right to phase eight, you're going through those stages of the of the actual implementation of the intervention and those three evaluation pieces, the process impact and then outcome evaluation. So typically when you're doing pre-seed, proceed, proceed uh, you look at the center of this slide here, you're starting all the way at the right. You're starting with the quality of life, kind of the overall big picture stuff, and then you're working backwards to identify and develop the health program that you see on the far left-hand side of the slide. So another planning model that we use in public health is what we call social marketing. Uh, this has been used with really some substantial su success, especially in the last couple of decades when we think about media-based interventions. So there's four P's that we talk about in social marketing campaigns, and that includes product, price, place, and promotion. Um, one key component is the role of marketing techniques. So what, what actually necessitates putting the primary target audience, in, this, you know, in a sense the consumer, at the center of every decision to, in a sense, buy a product? So if we think about this in a public health sense, the product is a behavior change or a health program or a technological component that's meant for public health purposes. So the product is what we're trying to get the, the customer, in a sense, to buy. And we usually think about that in terms of behavior change. The price is the second P in the four Ps. The price is all about what is the price of adopting that behavior change. This could certainly involve monetary incentives to minimize the cost or barriers for audience members to make the desired change. So uh, the price could be you know, the cost of a gym membership. If you have a program, a health program, that offers a free gym membership for people who want to be physically active, uh, that's the, the price of adopting the change could be less because you've minimized or removed that, that cost barrier for them. Place is the third P, so place is where the product is available. An intervention might offer uh, flu vaccines in a neighborhood through a mobile clinic that visits you know, the, a neighborhood every Wednesday afternoon, for example. Uh, another example is offering flu vaccines at your neighborhood grocery store. So this is where the product, the flu vaccine, is being promoted. You have it right there at the grocery store. People are already there shopping. They can just come in quickly and get their flu shot. The final P is what we call promotion. So this is how we promote those first three pieces using persuasive strategies. So like the other uh, health planning models and strategies that are out there, social marketing really draws on behavioral research. Um, some of the features of social marketing, such as identifying a target audience, they're not necessarily unique to this particular planning model. We know that pre seed proceeds certainly emphasizes the need to understand your target audience. So there's common elements uh, between and among these planning models. Uh, this slide here shows you just a couple of other um, key planning models that we use in public health, such as patch and match. Um, you can search these on your own time to really kind of understand the key features and components. Um, that said, I want to demonstrate to you that there certainly are uh, kind of key elements that are common among various public health planning models. And so let's kind of walk through these quickly. So community involvement and mobilization. I talked about this earlier, but I can't uh, emphasize the importance. You don't just want to be the outsider coming into a community and, and just doing stuff for them or onto them. You want to make sure that they are involved in much of the decision-making process and helping to really mobilize and, and have support for and trust with the researchers that are, are, that are doing the health programming. Second is the importance of doing a needs assessment, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, uh, about the importance of doing a needs assessment. Selecting specific target audiences, if there is a particular group that uh, a message needs to be shared with, um, figuring out who that is and figuring out the best way to reach them where they're at is certainly an important theme in lots of different planning models. Uh, you may have heard before of SMART objectives, so you want to make sure that when you're doing your planning, you're developing uh, indicators that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So uh, you want to make sure that you're really thinking through that as you're measuring and evaluating uh, the success of your program. Having an action plan development and then implementation uh, of the program, having things in writing, making sure that everyone is on the same page and following through uh, what their goals and objectives are at each stage uh, of the planning itself.
And then evaluation. We'll talk certainly more about this in a few moments, but evaluating not just the, from a process standpoint, but also from an impact and outcome standpoint. And then finally, evalu uh, institutionalization, right? You want to have some level of maintenance or sustainability over time. You don't just want this to be a one-shot deal. You want it certainly to work, uh, be effective, and then be able to be institutionalized in the long range. So I'm now going to launch uh, the next two polling questions, questions 10 and 11. So let's go through these two, and if you could kindly answer them, that'd be great. So question 10 says, in what phase of pre-seed are you assessing the community's wants and needs in order to improve health? So A, social diagnosis, B, epidemiological diagnosis, C, educational and organizational diagnosis, or D, administrative and policy diagnosis. And I will tell you that all four of those are pre-seed. I didn't try to trick you by throwing a pro-seed in there. So those are, the, are, in fact, the four phases. Awesome. OK, it looks like everyone got this quite well. So again, social diagnosis, you're asking the community what they want, what they need in order to improve community health and quality of life. And so when you do that in that first phase, that helps you to identify a community health outcome of interest that's relevant and that's appropriate given what their interests and needs are. Okay, so next question, question 11, asks about proceeds. So in what phase of proceed are you determining the extent to which the intervention is having the desired impact on the target population? So implementation, process evaluation, impact evaluation, outcome. Oh, great. Okay, so overall people did quite well on this. Impact evaluation, exactly. So impact evaluation answers the question, is the intervention having the desired impact on the target population? So this uh, phase seven really measures the effectiveness of the program with regard to those intermediate objectives, as well as the changes that you're hoping to see in the predisposing, enabling, and reinforcing factors. So overall quite well. Good job. Okay, so now we're in the last section where we're going to be covering program evaluation in greater detail, scaling up, and also sustainability. And so as we know, public health programs aim to prevent or control disease, injury, disability, and even mortality. And over time, as this task has become more complex, uh, the programs that we developed themselves have even become more complex. Increasingly, public health programs tend to address relatively large programs, and so the solutions to which must engage large numbers of community members and organizations in a vast coalition. It's all about partnership and uh, collaboration. Uh, more often than not, public health problems involve significant and difficult changes, uh, sometimes in attitudes and in risks and protective behaviors of the constituents themselves. And so in addition, the context in which public health programs operate has consequently become more complex. So programs that work well in some set settings might completely tank and fail miserably in other settings because of variations in fiscal or socioeconomic, demographic, even interorganizational settings um, in which they're rooted. And so just because something works somewhere else doesn't automatically mean that it's applicable in a different setting or within a different community. And so I want you to be mindful of that when you're thinking about how we do program evaluation as we're designing programs. So um, at the same time, the programs that we've developed uh, involved an in increased demand for accountability from policymakers, uh, from the grant funders, as well as from other stakeholders. So those certainly have increased over time. And so those changes in the, in the environment in which public health programs operate really mean that we need to have strong, reliable, well thought out, well designed program evaluation. And that's really essential, I would argue, now more than ever before. So what is program evaluation? What does it actually mean? I tend to think of it as a way of paying attention to uh, documenting and measuring the implementation of the program and its success in achieving the intended outcomes that you set forth, and then using that information to be accountable given your key stakeholders. So the nature and magnitude of the problem is part of your program evaluation. The processes, again, so are things being implemented and carrying out in the manner that it was originally intended? Outcomes, are we achieving those goals that we set to accomplish? Uh, both in the short and long term. And then efficiency is also important. Are the program activities that we're producing um, 
are they being produced with appropriate use of resources? So whether that's a uh, financial budget or staff time, um, those are some things that we think about from an efficiency standpoint. Um, we want to also make sure that we're thinking about, and the evidence base, as always, is guiding part of our decision making when we're considering the development of our programs that then, then ultimately have policy level implications, right? So um, even think about examples from um, more recently that you'll, you've seen with things like Berkeley, California, and uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania that have implemented a taxation on sweetened sugary beverages, right? So, uh, and then there's been a, several states that have that on their, their ballots or several municipalities back in the November election, right? So they, they did some program evaluation they, uh, to see that there, in fact, is there a scientific evidence to suggest that if we impose this tax on, you know, sugary sweetened beverages, uh, we should then that has a public health consequence, and that we should use that as a as a development of a of a policy down the line. So let's start with this idea of this nature and magnitude of the problem. So this is the first of the four key pieces that you saw on the previous slide, and so this is kind of the logical sequencing of the activities and the outcomes that we do in program evaluation. So we start with, with a needs assessment, and a common way to do a needs assessment is we determine the prevalence of the problem in the target population, what the health consequences are, or even the non-health consequences, and whether certain groups tend to be more affected than others. So some of the methods that we use when conducting a needs assessment include things like key informant interviews, uh, doing community-based uh, surveys, whether they're on paper and pencil or whether they're electronic. Also using other uh, resources that are available. So if we have publicly available data sets that can provide us with information, uh, public health agencies or clinics that can provide uh, information from medical records, for example, and even doing community forums. So what I'm going to do um, is kind of think you, have you walk through these four uh, kind of key steps of program evaluation using an example of a HPV vaccination. Uh, setting. So we know that uh, HPV vaccinations can be really great at uh, reducing um, uh, HPV, certainly, but then consequently cervical cancer. Unfortunately, we know that vaccination rates are lower than is desired. We're not hitting our target rate um, at uh, most municipalities, certainly most states, and even at the national level. And so we might want to think about in a certain community, well, let's figure out what's going on. Why are our vaccination rates lower than anticipated? We could do a needs assessment. We can talk to uh, the extent of the problem. We can talk about whether or not certain subgroups are affected by the problem in a different way. We can talk to teenagers. We can talk to parents. We can even talk to healthcare providers to figure out, OK, what's going on? Um, we can do key informant interviews, do surveys, look at data uh, that's available publicly to look at vaccination rates among these different groups. So let's say we decide that from the results of uh, the needs assessment, we want to do a training for uh, healthcare providers. So we know from our needs assessment, uh, from, the, from our, the methods that we've used, we know that it looks like healthcare providers, for example, need greater training about talking about a sensitive issue with parents and, and teens and even preteens about HPV. So if we go to the next slide for process evaluation, um, let's say we're going to design a training program for medical providers. They're going to get an intensive training about how to effectively counsel, screen, and treat um, uh, people when it comes to HPD. So in your process evaluation, it's all about the who, what, when, and how many. So it's about fidelity and outputs. We're going to design this program, this intensive training program for healthcare providers. We're going to deliver these activities uh, in uh, settings where they can do community, uh, continuing medical education, and we're going to help them to um, kind of build up this uh, uh, expertise when it comes to this training that we've done with for HPV vaccinations. So our process evaluation is going to help us answer the question, has this program, has this training program been implemented as intended? And the what, what are we actually doing? Who's delivering it? When and where are they delivered? And how many people are we serving? In this example, the people that we're serving are the, the healthcare providers themselves who are attending our training. From the, uh, the next slide talks more about outcome evaluation. So in your outcome evaluation, you're assessing the progress or the sequence of outcomes that the program is intended to address. And so you often describe the sequence using terms like short-term, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. You can even see terms like proximal and distal. Proximal are close to the intervention, distal are those that are farther away.
So depending on the stage of development of the program and the purpose of the evaluation, uh, outcome evaluations may include a bunch of different outcomes in the sequence. So you can include changing people's attitudes and beliefs. You can certainly see from a short-term perspective, you're going to have, you're hope to have increased knowledge about the importance of vaccines among pediatricians and um, internists and, and primary care providers. And they have increased skills to have the conversation with their patients and their patients' parents about the importance of the vaccine. From an intermediate outcome, you can see the behavior change. You actually can look at whether or not there's been a change in the behavior of the healthcare providers before and after your intensive training to see if they've um, increased their uh, rate of recommendation of the vaccines. And then long term, we can look to see, okay, does this intervention that we've done, does this you know intensive uh, training that we've provided to effectively counsel and screen and, and uh, advance the HPV vaccination among providers, has this resulted in an increase in the vaccination rates and ultimately a decrease in the rates of cervical cancer, for example. So we can follow those trends in morbidity and mortality over time. Finally, from an efficiency standpoint, we want to compare the costs to the effects. So cost effectiveness is all about answering the question, does the value or the benefit of this training program exceed the cost of producing them? So for every $1 spent in this program, I'm going to get a particular result. That's what cost-benefit analysis is all about. You also want to consider whether or not your program's activities, this training program that you've designed, is being produced with minimal use of resources. So we think about this from a budgetary standpoint, but also a staff time perspective. And so um, from, a, um, from an efficiency standpoint, we want to be thinking about answering the, those questions about, you know, does the benefits of offering this intensive training program justify a continued allocation of resources towards the program itself? I want to share with you on the next slide the CDC's framework for program evaluation that's been used by public health departments across the country. And so the CDC framework is a systematic method for program evaluation with six connected steps. You use these steps together as a starting point when you're tailoring an, an intervention for a particular public health effort. And so in order to uh, kind of get through these, you need to start with the earlier steps that really provide the foundation for subsequent progress. So before I walk you through each of these steps, let me quickly go through the center of the slide where you see those uh, standards. So the standards that you see uh, are, in, they in fact include 30. And this is all about the quality of the intervention activity, whether or not the evaluation activities are well designed, and they're working to their potential. And so the 30 standards are organized into four groups. Utility standards, which is ensuring that the evaluation serves the information needs of the intended users. Feasibility standards, ensuring that the evaluation will be realistic diplomatic and even frugal to a certain extent. Proprietary, uh, propriety standards, ensuring that your evaluation will be conducted legally and ethically. Accuracy standards, ensure that your evaluation will reveal and convey technically adequate information about the features that determine worth or merit of the program actually being evaluated. So a strong evaluation approach ensures that the following questions can be answered to make sure that the value of your program efforts can be determined, and then you can make a judgment about whether or not that value can be made based on the evidence. So here are some examples of questions. What is actually going to be evaluated? What is the program, and in what context does it exist? What aspects of the program are going to be considered when we're judging the performance of the program? What standards must be reached for the program to be considered successful, what evidence will be used to indicate how the program has been performing, what conclusions regarding program performance are justified when comparing the available evidence to the selected standards, and then finally, how will the lessons that we learn be used to improve public health effectiveness. So this CDC's evaluation framework provides a very systematic way to approach and answer these questions in the series of these, these yellow boxes that you see on the slide, these six steps that are outlined. What we're going to do is walk through each of these steps. So the next slide, we're, we're going to start with step one, which is engaging the stakeholders themselves. So this step is all about including those who are involved in program operations, those who are served by or affected by the program, and also the primary users of the evaluation. So this uh, involves fostering input and participation and sharing of kind of power, in a sense, um, to be able to think about those who have investments in how the evaluation is conducted, but also what the results are. 
this, this stage helps to really increase the chances that the evaluation is going to be useful, that you can improve the evaluation's credibility, and really avoid either real or potential conflicts of interest. Step two is where we actually are describing the program. And so this includes the needs, the expected effects, the activities, the resources, and also importantly includes a logic model. So we're going to spend the next few slides on step two of how we describe the program because I really think this is a, an important piece of the six. So we're thinking about uh, describing the program as a way to improve an evaluation's fairness and accuracy. It's really about permitting kind of a balanced assessment of the strengths and weaknesses and really helping your stakeholders understand how the program features kind of fit together like a puzzle and relate to each other in the larger context. So the logic model that you include as part of the step two is the idea of a, a pro, it's kind of a program planning model that can be used to help organize, design, implement, and evaluate any type of program. And it's really a nice template for describing what goes into the program, who's going to participate, what are the activities that you're going to do, what are the outcomes. Um, so it's very useful in terms of analyzing program assumptions and external factors that can influence the success. So the logic model forms a foundation for evaluating that success because it defines exactly what the program staff hopes to accomplish. So I've got uh, maybe three or four slides here that kind of walk through uh, some logic models in greater detail, and I think this will help drive home the message. So the next slide here, again, shows that the logic model provides a basic framework for an evaluation. It's a graphic that describes the program and the organizational elements in evaluation terms. So I really think there's two key kind of advantages in graphically displaying a program's activities and outcomes as opposed to just simply kind of putting them in a bulleted list. First, I think there's power in visual representation. So when you have this visual display or this graphic, it's kind of an effective learning instrument. Second, the logic model, kind of this visual representation, ensures that the program's process is not going to be overlooked or ignored in evaluation. It's about accountability for both the program's outcomes, but also the process itself. And so if we move from left to right at the bottom of the slide, we start with resources. These are inputs, contributions, investments that go into the program. Activities are what you're actually doing to reach the established objectives. I think about this as kind of the nuts and the bolts of what you're doing. Next comes outputs. These are the services or the events, the products that are reaching people who participate in your program or those who you're trying to target. This includes the number of staff that were trained. So the example I gave earlier about the HPV staff training, um, the number of community members that attend a meeting, those are all your outputs. And then your outcomes are the results or the changes that you see, either at the individual, group, community, or systems level. And so when we think about using a logic model, I like to think about it as a series of if-then statements. So if we have our, our resources, what we're starting with, then we should be able to do the activities that we see. And if we do those activities, then these are the products, services, or programs that are created. And if we have those outputs and they're achieved, then we should have some short-term changes. And then finally, in the outcomes, again, what are those long-term results that you expect to see as a result of those short-term changes? I've given you a, a kind of a classic, kind of simple example in the next slide of a logic model example, and I, but I think it's one that we can all relate to, and maybe some of you are feeling this way of a headache at the moment. So let's think about this. So let's imagine um, that we have a headache. That's our situation on the far left. And so what do we need to do? Where well, our experience might tell us that certain pills, like Advil or Tylenol or Aleve, are going to help us with our situation. So what do we need to get? We need to get the inputs, and the inputs are the pills. If we take the pills, that is our output, and as a consequence, our outcome is that our headache goes away and we start feeling better. Um, so this is the idea of uh, a couple of assumptions, though, that I think are here we need to think about. One is that we need to find or get the needed pills. We need to take them as prescribed, um, that the pills aren't going to lead to other side effects like a stomach ache or some other um, consequence. All programs have such assumptions, and they are often the basis for failure or less than a desirable results that we get. But again, you can see the logic of the diagram and the end results. The impact that you expect is that you feel better because your situation has been resolved, your headache has gone away. What really matters isn't whether we get the pills or whether we take the pills, but whether we feel better as a result. 
I've given you one more example of a logic model on the next slide, and that has to do with a family vacation. So for those of you who have siblings or have uh, happy or sad memories of family vacations, I thought this would be another example for you. So moving from left to right, we start with the inputs in this logic model. So we have our family members, our budget, our car, and all our camping equipment, because we're going to go on a family vacation camping. The outputs are the things that occur as a result of those inputs. So we drive to the park, we set up our camp, we cook, we laugh, we play, we hike, we go fishing. Those are our outputs. And then consequently, our outcomes are the results. Ideally, your family members learn about each other, you bond, you have a good time on your vacation. The next slide then just one more time walks you through this in terms of a series of, in, uh, of uh, inputs and if-then statements. And so what you see here is uh, from a tutoring program example. If we invest time and money in a tutoring program, then we can provide that service three hours per week for a school to 50 kids. If we provide the tutoring, then the, those students who are struggling academically can receive some assistance. If they get tutored, then they'll learn and improve their academic skills, which then leads them to have better grades. If they have better grades, then they're going to move on to the next grade level on time and not have to repeat a grade. So again, think about logic models as a series of if-then statements. The state, step three of the uh, framework that we're talking about is the next slide, which is the focus of the evaluation uh, design. And so this is really about assessing the issues of greatest concern to stakeholders while at the same time using time and resources as efficiently as possible. So we want to really consider the purpose, the users, and the questions, the methods that we're really considering here. So it's all about planning in advance where the evaluation is headed and what steps are going to be taken. This process tends to be quite iterative in nature. Um, and so sometimes our evaluation questions and methods might be adjusted to achieve an optimal match that facilitates use by our primary user. So really what you see here listed in the, the yellow bulleted points here is that different evaluation questions are relevant based on the stage of the program that you're at. So implementation fidelity questions certainly are critical when you're initiating the program. Short-term outcome of, uh, questions are certainly important once fidelity has been uh, kind of assured that it exists. And then finally, long-term outcome questions are appropriate after your program has documented both the short and the intermediate term effects. And so you really want to make sure that your stakeholders are involved in all these different phases. Uh, the next slide goes over step four, which is gathering creditable evidence. This is really to strengthen your evaluation judgment and then the, consequently the recommendations that follow. So these aspects of evidence are really about gathering uh, perceptions of credibility. So indicators, sources, quality, quantity, logistics. Um, when and if possible, you want to use existing data. So this step is all about compiling the information that your stakeholders perceive as trustworthy and relevant for answering their questions. This data can be qualitative or quantitative in nature. It can kind of a mixture of both. Um, you want to make sure that adequate data is available and accessible, or if not, you've got to then collect your own data uh, from scratch. Um, so whether a body of evidence is credible to stakeholders might depend on a variety of factors. So how the questions were asked, what the sources of the information were, what were some of the conditions that were involved in terms of the data collection, how reliable is the measurement, um, how valid are the interpretations uh, that you draw. So all of those are important when you're considering uh, the uh, collection of your credible evidence. The next slide goes over step five, which is how you justify your conclusions. So now that you've got all that credible evidence in the previous stage, you're going to link them together, and then you're going to judge them based on some agreed upon value or standard that's been set by the stakeholders. So you're really trying to justify your conclusions on the basis of the evidence that you've gathered in the previous step. Uh, so you're making claims regarding the program that are warranted based on the data that you've collected and against some pertinent and defensible ideas of not only merit but also value and significance. And so your conclusions certainly are justified when they're linked to the evidence that you've gathered and they're consistent with the agreed upon values and standards of the stakeholders themselves. Our next slide then goes through the sixth and final stage, and that's about ensuring use and lessons learned. Um, sometimes don't think that this is the last step, that it doesn't really matter, that it's not important. It certainly is really key, and I think sometimes people forget how valuable this can be. Um, when you're doing step six, it's all about designing, preparing, uh, doing feedback, follow-up, and dissemination. And so you're ensuring that stakeholders are aware of the evaluation procedures and their subsequent findings. 
that the findings are considered in decisions or actions that affect the program in the future, and that for people who participate in the value pro process itself have had overall a, a beneficial experience. So your choice of dissemination of materials should really be tailored based on who your target audience is. So if you are providing you know, some type of um, scientific dissemination at APHA's annual conference, how you uh, communicate and disseminate that evaluation information is certainly going to be different from something that is uh, given towards the stakeholders at the community level. Um, so how you're doing an internal communication strategy for members of your stakeholder group is going to be different from how you disseminate the information for public access as you, you know, develop a website or you develop a, a billboard about some of your uh, findings about moving forward. So really think about your communication and dissemination plan that's appropriate and, and tailored based on who your target audience is. Okay, so the next, quickly, we're going to go through one other model that we use on the next slide in addition to the CDC framework, and this is what we call the RE-AIM model. Like the CDC framework, it has a strong emphasis on translating those research programs into practice. And so the RE-AIM framework is designed to enhance quality, speed, and public health impact of your efforts to translate those research into practice using five different steps. So that's what the RE-AIM stands for all of the five steps. We start with reach, then effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. So we'll start with step one at the top of the slide, which is reach. How do you reach your intended target population? Can the program attract large and a representative percentage of the population that you're trying to target? Effectiveness. Does it work? How do I know if this intervention actually was effective? Stage three, adoption. Um, you need to think about it. Uh, is the program feasible in our real world settings? Stage four, implementation. This is all about consistency and cost and adaptations that are made during the delivery. Can the program be consistently implemented across program elements with different staff or in different settings? And importantly, with fidelity being maintained. And then finally, stage five is all about maintenance. Can you maintain the intervention effects over time in different settings? Does the program include principles that can enhance long-term improvements and sustainability over time? So it's just not this one-shot deal. Okay, so we're in the last section here on the next slide, home stretch. Uh, thank you again for staying on board and through the through the remainder of this uh, webinar here. So we're just going to quickly go through dissemination and scaling up. Dissemination is defined as really the targeted distribution of information and our intervention materials themselves to a particular public health audience or to a clinical practice audience. And so how can we do wider adoption of evidence-based health promotion, disease prevention strategies? That All that depends on how we develop and test test the effective dissemination approaches themselves. So this is really about, dissemination is about bridging gaps between public health, clinical research, and everyday practice by building up and strengthening a scientific knowledge base about the mechanisms whereby health information, interventions, and scientifically based clinical practices are in fact adopted in the public health world as well as the healthcare service delivery world in a wide variety of settings. Scaling up is something that's a little bit different. In the health sector, this means kind of doing something in a big way to improve some aspect of a population's health. So it's really about increasing a program's impact while still maintaining high quality. Within this kind of broad definition of scaling up, uh, you can think about uh, scaling up being applied to various components of your logic model. So this kind of should all kind of connect here. So from your logic model, think back on the far left, we had inputs or resources. This is about mobilizing more funds or getting more staff to implement your program. From an output perspective of your logic model, this is about providing more services, whether it's a greater access or a greater range of services that are available. It also can include, include uh, performing better, so having improved efficiency or improved quality as an output. Going back to your logic model for outcomes, scaling up can be about reaching more people, having greater coverage, and also attracting more or different clients. It's all about utilization. Finally, you can think about scaling up in your logic model in terms of impact, so having a greater reduction in overall morbidity or mortality as we move to the right-hand side of your logic model.
The next slide shows you the four primary categories of scaling up. What I'm going to do is provide you, and I think I've learned in, in doing these presentations that students often uh, benefit most when I give you an example to help you understand these strategies. So let me, before you get to the details out here on the slide with the four categories of scaling up, let me give you a little bit of background. So in July of 2013, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS launched a brand new framework and their goal was to really accelerate action to try to reach 15 million people with life-saving treatment for those living with HIV, giving people antiretroviral treatment. And the goal was to get 15 million people access to these medications by 2015. The framework that uh, the joint uh, program created offered countries and partners both practical and innovative ways to increase the number of people that could access these life-saving medications. And so it would help people who have the HIV live longer, healthier lives, but ideally too, it would also help prevent new infections from occurring. So um, the scaling up of these medications is really kind of an unprecedented global success story for public health and that we should really try to maintain this momentum, trying to figure out innovative ways to enable more people to take the medication. So to get to 15 million people on medication is a, is a pretty substantial goal. Um, this further, uh, the furthering of the scaling up of access to these meds was really to try to change, tip the balance, right? So helping certainly the people who were infected with HIV live longer, healthier lives, but it was also about helping to prevent uh, incident infections from occurring. So when we think about this from the four different categories of scaling up, the first is about quantitative, right? So we're trying to get more people, adding a new target audience, expanding into new geographic areas, getting more people on HIV medications in a wide variety of countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the quantitative piece of scaling up. From a functional standpoint, let's think about it with a different example. So let's say you have a program that was originally intended to focus on HIV screening among all patients who come to the emergency department, regardless of their reported risk behaviors. From a functional standpoint of scaling up, maybe now you say, well, you know what, maybe we're going to include HIV, uh, hepatitis C testing in addition to the HIV screening. Because if someone presents to the emergency department with substance use, you know what, we're also going to do the hep C testing in addition to the HIV testing. You choose to do this because your uh, local estimates tell you that nearly one quarter of HIV positive people are also hep C positive. And so from a functional standpoint, this is allowing you to have a broader focus by increasing the number or the type of technical areas that are covered by your public health program because you're now expanding it into hepatitis C testing. Okay, we're now going to go through the final uh, two categories of scaling up on the next slide, and that includes political and organizational. So from a political category, this is all about addressing national level barriers to effective program services. So figuring out how you can advocate or develop not only efficient processes, but also clear policies and guidelines, and kind of making materials that are standardized for not only education components, but also training, for, particularly for healthcare providers. So um, not reinventing the wheel in a sense, and creating these um, kind of broad-based uh, effective programs and services. The fourth category of scaling up is organizational. So this is really improving upon your ability to deliver and support an initiative uh, from a sustainability standpoint. So figuring out, okay, if we got this program, this is going to work, but we need, we need a funding base. We need the allocation of resources. We need more staff. How can we build that um, capacity to be able to sustain these efforts over time? And how can we do that within the organizational structure that we operate? And so that's the fourth and final category of scaling up. Okay, next slide quickly just talks about effective strategies for sustainability beyond the initial funding period. So we're thinking about as we scale up and as we're trying to um, build things into the future and have them be maintained over time, we need to think about how we can build as I said earlier, organizational capacity, but also community capacity. This thing can include fundraising, certainly, but also advocacy and management. Just because we build it doesn't mean they come and doesn't mean that the, the walls and the structure will be maintained. So how can we utilize and create user-friendly materials that are generalizable so we don't have to incur a new expense every time we re have to recreate a material? The involvement of community members in various steps of the program is so important. Um, community members often have such a valuable insight into the pulse of the community that they're a part of, and making sure that they're involved um, and getting seeking their input, I think, is, is certainly advantageous. 
We want to think about how we can also develop cost recovery mechanisms in the long term when we think about a, a cost efficiency standpoint. And then certainly related to that, we want to think about quality assurance. How can we build self-assessment tools um, so people are you know, constantly in a cycle of asking, how can we monitor what we're doing? How do we know how to do better? If we can develop and implement an institutional quality assurance, uh, it's something that we are it's kind of second nature that we don't have to really think about. Certainly, as you know, building on pre-existing structures, can you move a standalone program in one clinic so, can it so it can exist and then share resources with other clinics is an idea. Uh, developing program leaders and really public health champions. Ideally, you want to have more than one champion because if that one champion leaves your community or you know, uh, is in other ways unavailable, uh, that changes things. So having uh, greater than one is certainly important. And then finally, when we're thinking about strategies for ensuring sustainability, we want to think about cross-community learning. How can we take advantage of what uh, programs have been conducted in other communities and how can we apply those principles from a lesson learned perspective uh, to help in our own community that we're a part of. Okay, so I've got two final uh, questions uh, for the webinar for today uh, that we'll go through, and then after that, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions as they uh, can come up. So which of the following is not a step in the re-aim framework? A, reach, B, assessment, C, implementation, D, maintenance, E, organizational. Correct. Okay, so organizational is not. This actually was a bit of a trick question, though, uh, and so I threw this in there just to see what y'all would think. So you knew that uh, the O in organizational was not part of the acronym REAIM, but technically B is also not correct. The A does not stand for assessment. The A actually stands for adoption. So it's about adoption by the targeted, uh, the staff, the setting of the institutions. Um, so for those 4% of you who actually chose B, you also were technically right. Uh, but the, most of you got it, uh, you recognizably understand uh, organizational is not part of the REAIM framework. OK, uh, we've got the 13th and final question here. Uh, so that is, uh, which of the following is not a category of scaling up? Quantitative, qualitative, functional, or organizational? Fantastic. Okay, so most of you got this. Qualitative is not a, a, a specific category within scaling up. Um, uh, I'm a, I don't know why the other ones uh, may have gotten such higher percentages, higher than I may have anticipated. It could just be that y'all are losing steam after a three-hour webinar. Uh, but I really thank you for your, your time and attention today. I wish you the best of luck as you uh, prepare and continue to prepare for your exam. As I mentioned uh, more than once, you're more than welcome to send me an email if you've got follow-up questions uh, that I can help you with. It's Mona, M-O-N-A, at buffalo.edu. Uh, for those of you who are interested, if you have some questions now, I'm happy to take them in the last couple of minutes that we have available. Mona, there's a question, is the social ecological model always or most often framed in terms of understanding and changing behavior? I've seen reference to social ecological model of behavior. In short, is this behavioral theory, however, expansive? Hmm, that's a good question, yeah. So usually we think about the social ecological model in terms of health behavior change directly. Um, Sometimes you could think about it, if I'm understanding the question, in terms of a, a more social phenomenon. What I like about the model is that kind of those four key points that I had um, addressed at the beginning. So it's not that one level is better than another, uh, but it's the idea that we need to think about interventions that um, recognize the uh, multi-level functions. Interventions themselves tend to be most effective and that there are influences that interact across levels. So while I like the nesting that shows that one is embedded in another, I don't want you to think that that slide shows the boxes because they are 
um, they uh, don't allow for influence across and interaction across the levels. So really, certainly there are multiple factors that influence health behavior. What this model does is just provide a framework to talk about what those mechanisms may be that influence health and disease, um, but it's not that uh, there's a uh, one-size-fits-all approach to it. And again, the idea is that the most these tend to be most powerful when they are behavior-specific. You really want to identify the most relevant potential influences at each of the levels, and then use those to be able to think about intervention design and development down the line. Okay. Um, in the essence of time, if you have any questions, uh, specific questions, please go ahead and email mona at buffalo.edu, or you can uh, email info at mbthg.org. And I want to thank everyone today that participated, and thank you to Sarah Mona Prezilla, our speaker from the University at Buffalo, who um, presented on social and behavioral sciences. Um, this webinar was recorded and will be archived on the MBPHD website uh, one to two days afterwards. And uh, please do not forget to register for the five remaining uh, sessions, the study sessions. And you can register for those online at the website as well. So thank you again, Sarah Mona, and thank you uh, to everyone that participated, and good luck on the CTH exam. Thank you very much. Happy New Year to everyone. Goodbye.